Are you interested in the BMW X5M? Well, my favorite here, the Marina Bay Blue metallic color. Really awesome. But there's more about this car, especially power-wise. And here in Autogefühl, let's dig deeper in the exterior and the interior here at the LA Motor Show. Let's go. The X5M in this generation here also features the bigger double kidney in the front, black frame and also those black vertical fins in there and they're always open whereas the base X5 has those adaptive air intakes in the double kidney but here you maybe need a little bit more cooling depending on how you're driving. Yeah, I know you would hit the throttle. I know you. <laughs> then the headlamps come with LED as standard and those are the optional laser lights here at the moment with the blue accentuations and the beautiful daytime running light right there. Bigger air intakes also in the lower part and a stronger spoiler right there. So big stands on the road, even bigger than of course here for the X5M. Also the side profile just beautiful in this color. We have here also the Wheel arches painted in the vehicle color. In the M model, usually it would start you know, with a plastic fender in the base model. Here, exclusive 21 inch wheels, pretty massive, bigger brakes. Also, those performance M brakes with the blue brake calipers, they fit to that one very well. Then we've got contrasting black mirrors to the side with an aerodynamic shape. And of course, the X5, difference to the X6, which is also available as the M model. Check out that video as well. It would be have the falling roofline here. In this case, then the classic SUV shape and also some stronger shoulder line. You can see here that the design line is raising right here just a little bit. And you can see how the designers divide in light and shadow and of course, depending on your perspective. And another M styling is here, but that one has no function. It's closed. It's just to yeah, create a little bit more attention. What's your take here on the M design? At the rear, the new X5 generation has those horizontal tail lamps, looks more modern, and also in a three-dimensional shape, that's pretty cool. And this one is also the competition model, a little bit more horsepower, and also has the lettering right there. And some more extra equipment, or some more standard equipment, so to say, if you compare it to the just X5 model, X5M model. Then here, those diffuser elements and next to the real exhaust this is no fake at all so pretty massive special m exhaust and suspension wise there will be the adaptive m suspension so there's no air suspension then in this case but it will still be a good compromise between sportiness and comfort i hope we will test it also in our test driving very soon usually in a normal base model you can also go without an air suspension that's no problem and this one here also the m models get an active differential also for the rear axle to get more power on the ground. Of course, all-wheel drive for all those models and they do have the typical BMW rear wheel bias from those platforms that are still rear wheel driven or then, you know, have this typical rear wheel biased all-wheel drive. Under the hood, we have a 4.4 liter V8 turbocharged petrol engine either with 600 horsepower or in the X5 um, competition model with 625 horsepower and the acceleration difference is just 3.9 or 3.8 seconds to 1 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. Pretty powerful for this kind of heavy car, definitely. And we already drove the V8 engine both with the X6 and the X5 in the current generation. So check out those reviews. We will link a few interesting reviews of the X5 and the X6 in the video description and also in the pinned comment. Now to the interior, door closing sound. And I also not only like the door closing sound, which is solid, also you know, how the doors are really like, you know, such a small panel gap right there. Everything is very seamlessly integrated. 
and inside of the doors already from high quality and then you've got the honeycomb style right there and the nice contrasting style between black and white those inserts here look carbon fiber alike but they are just you know just a visual element you can optionally also get a real carbon fiber if you like x5m competition batch in the lower end then you have the m steering wheel with some contrast stitches and the interesting thing here is you can configure those buttons here m1 and m2 and have your own settings on there whatever you want to change with your driving mode and then there are special sport seats and i like this color styling where you have the blue on the exterior and the beige or you know or this indicate this almost white on the interior however this one here in the m model only animal skin with those sport seats a normal bmw x5 can also be bought with sensor tech that's animal friendly leatherette also in different colors usually in black and beige so that would be my tip for usual x5 and sitting in there is a little bit more comfortable than with the X6. Not because the seat would be much different, but rather because the A-pillar is a little bit more upright and you have a little bit more space in here, a little bit more spacious feeling, so to say. Um, that makes it a little bit more open, a little bit more, yeah, cozy definitely in the X5 to me. It's just, an, you know, that you have this feeling. The seat can be controlled in the various electric ways also just the top part of the seat for example and it's a really good comfortable seating position so also on long journeys you're feeling fine really looking forward to test this one here in person again as i said we already tested the v8 in different reviews also different horsepower specs it will be a different horsepower spec here and everything will be you know even crisper and sport here and so on steering wheel here with the electric control and Considering I'm 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1, and people know that if they have subscribed to Autogefühl. Wait a minute. If you're one that haven't subscribed, you should do it right now. And if you're a long term subscriber with us, thumbs up for you. <laughs> so, and then there's still some headroom right left here. There is a panoramic roof available. It's not powered at the moment, but you can also open that. You can also go without it, but it should leave some more nice light in. There's also a cover for that available you can close, but I also have some feedback from time to time saying, oh, you know, I live in Texas or something and I never go for panoramic roofs because it gets so hot even with the shade in summer. It's also an interesting aspect to look at it. By the way, this box here is for the head-up display, which is for X5M and X6M as standard equipment. So at least they put some more standard equipment here if you're already uh, <laughs> not buying a house but a car. You know, of course, pricing will be quite ridiculous for this version. Now to the interior overview, where again we have this cover. Actually, I mean, it looks quite nice, but it feels a little bit cheap. I don't know. Um, but the MLED ambient lighting, that's pretty cool, especially here in the blue color, also in the lower end. Here again with the X5M badging. Also, the blue car is being shown in the, you know, in the widescreen format. This, by the way, is a standard setup. They don't offer anything else for this car. Sadly, animal skin cover for that. Here you can also get a sensor tech cover um, that would be a little bit more sustainable for the top dashboard. Still some manual controls here, for example, for the temperature, like that, and also for the volume control with the metal knurling around. Then you've seen the steering wheel already in compact size with the special mode buttons right there. Also shifting pedals are available, heated steering wheel. In the lower part, you got the special shifting lever also with the transmission controls and the red start stop engine button and this lower part by the way you can slide open for inductive charging pad apple carplay wireless connection and also some usb a recharging and heated and cooled front cup holders so and then in this m menu a special one you can configure actually everything right here and there you can see this one does not have a two-wheel drive function, not a rear-wheel drive function like with the M5 or M8, but that's totally fine for an SUV, you know. But um, 4WD Sport means it has, you know, different emphasis. Here it's more even and here less on the front wheels, but more bias on the rear wheels. So you can set that, for example, then to your special button. And of course, all the other commands you have in here. I really like it when in the instruments you'll get the actual color of your exterior car. Well, maybe not one-to-one, -one, but at least it's blue, you know. And RPMs can go up counterclockwise, but there's also special M mode in the instruments available 
where we have then those special gauges as well and they look a little bit different, a little bit sportier if you have the engine really lit on. Lower middle console here, camera button for example, or camera system, transmission settings you can also change right here, with special control stitches for this M shifting lever. Then to control the infotainment system, of course we are touch, but also here that's both possible or then again with the voice command saying hey BMW and so on. Then on the left side, start stop engine button in red, and you have the M modes right there where you can access that, for example. Um, so you don't have to pick individual stuff. Then you have like road, sport, and a track mode. Usually you keep it in road mode, yes. Um, then you also can change the exhaust note, for example. And yeah, this is then the black piano like how this doesn't look so good, especially on the motor show. If it's your private car, probably a little bit easier to keep that one clean. And the middle console. Good split opening with a USB-C charger, so we have both USB-A and C. So let's get inside and it's really good to see in this bright interior we had the X6M as well, so you can tune into that review. We have the darker interior, but here you can very well see what's going on. The package is not really good with this vehicle, so you don't have too much legroom, although it's not a short car. Also those sports seats are more voluminous but still for adults work easily, also headroom-wise. Here easier in the X5 as well because the roofline just goes straight. And also this rear bench is rather upright, so it's a good seating position. If you compare it to a Mercedes GLE, which is also now available as the 63, then the problem is there the seat bench falls a little bit, you know, even stronger in the GLE Coupe and also in the X6. So that is less comfortable to sit in, especially in the rear when it falls backwards. Here a little bit more upright, yeah, and here you can also lift them with the headroom, definitely, that's no problem. So we feel a little bit more open, a little bit more spacious than in the X6, that's the advantage here for the X5. You also have some middle cup holders right here, and this one can also be used as a ski hatch. And then you have those optional infotainment systems, but you don't have to go for them, and I think they're actually pretty useless, because they just mirror what's going on in the front, and I don't think it's good for crash safety and when I know no kids of you know some some colleagues of mine or something they use their own devices anyway and wouldn't do anything on a BMW device they have put in already here or oh, what's your take on that guys so let's open the trunk and typical X5 split way right here here we go so you can use this then you know for short picking or so on and it also really works when two people are sitting on that one here. You can also slide this one open, it's really cool then with the hydraulic strut. Replacement tire right there. And you can also flip the seats right from here. It's a very good folding mechanism and this is really cool, it gives you a lot of space and you can actually close this cover right there. Not going right all through but still it's, you know, it's nice, and, um, you know, Everything is really nice from the finish also here, when you look at those details. So, that's also what I like about the X5. You're not really limited in the luggage capacity and also not in the height right here. And now to our conclusion, BMW X5 M for today. Wow, I mean, this is really one of my favorite colors ever for a vehicle overall. So very beautiful and all this color combination, the blue on the exterior and the white on the interior, that's just marvelous. Here the M model, of course, a stronger styling, stronger sense on the road, but already the normal X5 looks quite strong nowadays with this new generation. You have a little bit more room inside also in this new generation if you compare it to the predecessor X5M and also more power under the hood, especially in the competition model. Of course, you don't need that power. If you want to go with a normal V8 in the M, 50i for example that will also do just fine we also have some reviews of that for example from x5 or the x6 you can tune into that and that one the m50i was already very very powerful and also so much power still on the rear wheels you really feel a rear wheel bias with this vehicle and you will even more feel it in the true m model and you really have to be careful maybe leave those esc systems on with this car first at least when you're on the road and yeah this won't be moved on the racetrack i think no one really does that although it's theoretically also capable of with everything that has been upgraded. They even say that the air intakes are, you know, then thermal-wise racetrack proof. Yeah, <laughs> very interesting. Interior has a high build quality, sadly no animal skin alternative. You have to go over the BMW individual program if you say, yeah, you want also a little bit more animal friendliness in the interior. 
and it's a really interesting, especially on the motor show and when I'm, you know, traveling here in, in Los Angeles and California, so many people approach me and tell me, yeah, you know, I'm also a car enthusiast, but I also love animals, so I really think this approach is really cool that you raised this um, this topic. So it's really good that I also get the you know, very positive feedback of that. That really means a lot. Really cool. So other than that, this X5 is very usable also in the trunk space. It's also an advantage if you compare it to the X5, you know, with the limited height and so on. If you think about X6M or X5M, I would always go with the X5 in general. I really also like the recent X5P half model. Tune into that review if you're interested. Maybe just you know looking that from here for some beauty shots and for like, oh, that's cool. But really buy an X5 and you rather go with the normal, you know, 40i, for example, also then with the PF. Tune into those reviews. We all have, you know, we almost have the whole model range of those cars available. Just use the YouTube search, for example. Always type in Auto Gefühl BMW X5, then you'll find everything. And we will always link interesting videos in the video description or also in the pinned comments. Now please also tune into our comment section and discuss this vehicle here with us. Which one would you actually go for, X5 or the X6? Tune, you know, tune into that review as well. And what do you think about the approach in making such a powerful SUV here? Definitely can keep up with all the competitors now as for the power figures and also, of course, with everything else. Thank you so much that you tune into this party and also tune in to more videos from the Los Angeles Motor Show. So what do we know about the Tesla Cybertruck? Well, we know that the presentation failed to give evidence that the windows are, so to say, bulletproof. Indeed, the glass broke twice in the live test, which was pretty embarrassing. And we know that Tesla lost almost a billion dollars in market worth due to analysts who now think Elon Musk has completely lost his mind with building a bravely designed electric pickup truck. But what about the truck itself? Because frankly, if the glass is extra strong or not won't matter to most of the buyers and also Tesla still wants to fix that issue. So can this unique truck be successful? The design is something very, very special. It looks like a stealth army vehicle, a Batmobile or maybe something from a science fiction film. Range is supposed to be 500 miles plus or more than 800 kilometers, which would be insane. The acceleration figure is sports car like with under 3 seconds to 60 miles per hour or 100 kilometers per hour. It can tow more than 14,000 pounds and carry up to 3,500 pounds with a vault length of 6.5 feet. Storage capacity is 100 cubic feet altogether with lockable storage including the vault, trunk and sail pillars. The suspension goes up and down 4 inches in each direction. The body consists of 30 times cold rolled stainless steel. Inside there'll be a 17 inch touchscreen. It offers space for up to 6 adults. As for charging you'll be able to use the new V3 technology for even faster charging. There are a lot of memes out there already and everyone has to say something about that truck. Mostly funny stuff. And I mean why not, it does provoke and people talk about it. And the failed demonstration at the presentation might end up boosting the popularity. The same way the stock price is sometimes hyped, the same way the negative reaction on the Cybertruck reveal was exaggerated on the market. So what do I think? Well, first of all, there's no serious all-electric pickup truck on the market yet. So that's a great market niche. First and best argument that this thing will actually sell. And if you then think about some very aggressive designs of combustion engine pickups, maybe this one here is not too far away from the target group of a F-150 Raptor or something like that. So the most interesting thing will be the comments here, especially from truck customers. Would you consider a Tesla Cybertruck maybe as the next buy instead of an F-150 or a Toyota Tundra or Ram 1500 and so on? I think, well, why not? Elon Musk has brought electric revolution to other segments so far. We rather expected a Tesla Model X-like truck and that would have also worked for sure. Is it better when it looks like Astro Mad Max now? Hard to say. Probably the more conservative variant would have been easier to sell. So at the end of the day, I think that some kind of Model X pickup truck would have been more appealing to most car buyers. On the other hand, you shouldn't underestimate the power of attention and the power of buying something pretty unique. Let's see how it plays out. What do you think? Let's talk about the most important facts about the Ford Mustang Mach-E. 
Well, first of all, the very important thing about the name. Let me just say it pretty easily. No, 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 never, ever, never, never, ever, ever use Ford Mustang for an electric SUV. Period. So those are my two cents with it. <laughs> and what's your take on that? Um, I mean, seriously, how can they use Ford Mustang in this combination? I mean, why? They could have used maybe like a Mustang logo in the front. Why not? And then argue, yeah, it's like a sporty heritage and something. But just call it Ford Mark E and that's it or whatever, you know what? Why shall they complete the name with Mustang in it? I think it does not make any sense at all. But that should actually still not distract from the fact that it's a very interesting car featuring a 75.7 kWh battery or even a bigger one on choice, 98.8 kWh. So Tesla sizes for the battery and the range for the bigger version will be supposed to be 480 km or 300 miles. DC charging will be up to 150 kilowatts and you see there are not so many electric SUVs on the market yet so this will also fill in quite well on the market so far. There will be different horsepower output versions for example 330 horsepower for the GT version and even 460 horsepower for the GT performance version. Then the acceleration figure will be about three and a half seconds so pretty fast. There will be rear wheel drive models or all wheel drive models then you know they will have the X in the name as well and you can also get Brembo aluminum brake calipers for more braking performance and even the interior is very interesting yes they are really looking to Tesla right there this new sync infotainment system in 15.5 inch also with this vertical orientation so yes it is something you know like a Tesla Model X definitely you can see the influence the sunroof by the way features a special glass coating against UV rays that's supposed to keep it cooler also in hot summer days. You can also unlock your car with Bluetooth or your smartphone, that will be possible. And the capacity of the trunk, so in the front, will be 4.8 cubic feet, whereas the rear trunk will master 29 cubic feet up to 59.6 cubic feet when the seats are down. The question is, what do you think about the design on the exterior and also on the interior? Definitely a very sleek and sporty looking car, so yes from the sporty heritage yeah it might be mustang alike we also see some resembling design elements but still about the name no 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 <laughs> would really like to hear your opinion if you share um, mine here on this one yeah but um you know don't give the video just some sound because you dislike the name i think we still have to look at the car and Ford really utterly needed a model like this so I think that's a very very good development even if we cannot agree on the right naming so what's your take here on the new Ford Mustang Mark E
Pre Collision Assist with automatic emergency braking scans the road ahead and can alert you to potential collisions with vehicles or pedestrians detected in your path. If an impact becomes imminent and you don't need corrective action, the brakes can apply automatically. But don't worry, they'll only activate if they're needed. The Blind Spot Information System can help make changing lanes a lot less stressful. Cross Traffic Alert can detect traffic behind you when you're slowly backing out of a parking spot or driveway. If you activate your turn signal while an obstacle is detected in your blind spot, an alert will flash on the outside mirror. Once your blind spot is clear, the indicator will turn off and you can make your lane change. The Lane Keeping System scans your vehicle's position between the lines in the road ahead and can alert you if you're starting to edge out of your lane. Auto High Beam Headlamps can sense poor lighting conditions and switch on to light your path ahead. They can even sense oncoming headlights and dim automatically so you don't have to worry about distracting other drivers. Post-collision braking can potentially lessen the severity of a secondary collision by automatically applying moderate brake pressure when an initial collision event is detected. The rear view camera can help make backing up easier. When you shift into reverse, the camera displays a video image of what's behind your vehicle, along with guidelines to help you stay on track. Reverse Brake Assist can detect both stationary and moving objects behind your vehicle, alerting you to potential hazards. It can also apply the brakes if you don't stop in time and can even detect vehicles crossing behind you at up to 37 miles per hour. Intelligent Adaptive Cruise Control includes features like stop and go, lane centering and speed sign recognition. It can bring the vehicle to a stop when needed if traffic ahead has stopped or slowed. When traffic clears, you'll resume your set speed. The lane centering feature even scans lane markings to help keep your vehicle centered between the lines. Once you've activated the speed sign recognition feature and set your preferred speed, the system can detect and automatically adjust to speed limit signs along your route. Evasive steering assist can help make it easier to avoid a potential collision. It doesn't steer for you, but it can provide extra steering support if the system's warning goes off and you need to maneuver around the vehicle ahead. The navigation system can help you stay confidently on course. And that's not all. It can also point you to the nearest charging stations or coffee shops and even suggest places to stop based on your interests. Think of available Active Park Assist 2.0 as parking made easy. When engaged, it can help you locate a potential parking spot, even in those tight parallel or reverse perpendicular spots. All you have to do is brake to a complete stop, shift into neutral, and hold down the Active Park Assist button. Your vehicle does the rest. True to its name, the available 360-degree camera lets you see around your vehicle from every side. When you're driving at slow speeds, multiple camera angles give you an enhanced view of your surroundings and more confidence. This is a new top sports version of the Mercedes GLE in this new generation. The Mercedes AMG GLE 63S, the 63 and the 63S model. We'll go into all details, exterior and interior and the power figure. And we will compare the bigger AMG brother here, the Mercedes GLS or Mercedes AMG GLS 63. So let's find out more together here in Autogefühl. Let's go. In the front of the GLE 63, 
or also the 63S. <laughs> you can see those vertical fins right there, strong front grille. Sensors are hidden behind the Mercedes logo. Then the LED daytime running light is all the same for all GLEs. LED is always standard and then you can top it up if you want this multi-beam LED, for example. Here at the moment, those are the standard LED lights. Then a stronger lower part here as well, stronger spoiler in vehicle contrast color. Here the brilliant blue color. Wow, this is also very screaming out color. A typical Thomas blue we have here on Auto Fuel. Very typical for the Mercedes GLE is that we have the C-pillar which stands, let's say, against the wind. So this is a typical iconic shape for the GLE. And of course the GLE, if you compare it to the GLS, a shorter car. And you can see here the handles have this contrast color. A little bit more fingerprints here on the motor show, but they will be cleaner otherwise. And standard, this one here comes with an air suspension in the AMG 63 model. But it's a little bit stiffer from a setup and when you go faster than 120 kilometers or faster than 75 miles an hour then it goes a little bit more down and also when you go to a sports mode then it also lowers a little bit to be more aerodynamic and so on. In this case the wheel arches are painted in vehicle color and it starts with 20 inch wheels with the 63 model and the 63S model 21 inch. Those ones are the optional 20 two inch yeah with the gls we have one inch more actually you'll soon see that but it's a pretty nice styling and then the v8 batch right there soon more under the hood contrasting mirror caps there there's this night package also available where you have then everything you know in black for example all the frames and so on and this optional side step here if it's useful or not but it definitely catches more visual attention and last but not least the important technology detail is that they have an anti-roll stabilization here which is not available for the non-AMG models but 53 and 63 get this anti-roll stabilization for the you know we have the GLE Coupe recently seen in the 53 version so those ones then GLE 63 in the GLE 53 with the Coupe get this stabilization and for the anti-roll it's actually quite helpful then when you go a little bit faster. A modern tail lamp signature here in this new generation of the GLE. And the same, of course, goes for the 63 S model in this case. They have a special S right there. Well, those exhaust tips on the outside, they are indeed just for view. The real exhaust on the inside, that is different, for example, with BMW, who also have the X5M and the X6M here on stage on the Los Angeles Auto Show. You can also tune into those videos to compare them. But still a massive look also with his diffuser style right there. So tell us, how do you like it? So we have a 4 liter V8 bi-turbo under the hood with either 571 or 612 horsepower in the S model. There we go. Well, the cover has an AMG cover, yes, but I think it could be a little bit more beautiful. Hand-built engine, so by one guy. There's also this batch. This guy is called I think Volker Haag, yes, he built this engine. And acceleration figure, four seconds or 3.8 seconds for the S model, then to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. All wheel drive, of course. And it's a variable all wheel drive, has a little rear wheel bias as well. And then it all can also shift the momentum rear and front wheels depending on the situation. In the front, the GLS 63 AMG, and there's no S model because this one here already has the full horsepower output, just to say in advance. So in the front, it has a little bit bigger front grille, and then, but again, this vertical fins right there, the same AMG styling. The multi-beam LED, so the more extensive LED option with the high beam function come as standard with the GLS here. Of course, the price is also a little bit higher in general. And again, a very strong lower bumper here in the contrasting color to the white. So the GLS is 28 centimeters or 11 inches longer than the GLE. That counts for all the versions, of course, also here for the AMG. And what we have here, the side steps once again, then the night package. And wow, what about those wheels? Those are pretty unique, aren't they? So it starts already with an inch larger than the GLE. So it's 21 inch for the AMG model and an optional 23 inch the ones you can see here, but also different designs available if that's not your favorite one. Painted wheel artists as well and above a speed of 120 kilometers or 75 miles now. Also again, 10 millimeters lower. Also, when you put in the sports mode, the air suspension also standard here goes lower. 
Well, the GLS is a little bit more upright right here, a little more space, a little bit longer. This will more have an effect on the interior, of course, especially if you appreciate this seven-seater. And that's actually, you know, the sense of the GLS. With the GLE, it's also optional, but doesn't make too much sense. But here with the GLS, yeah, it's then seven-seater all the way. So in the rear of the GLS, a little bit more upright window to get some more space for the last row and of course and also for the, for the trunk. And then the tail ends are a little bit higher but have the same basic design and also those fake exhaust tips on the outer part. Those are also the same here for the AMG model and they both come with a sports exhaust. And also the GLS gets this anti-roll stabilization that is exclusive to the AMG models. So there's no differentiation between 63 and 63S in the GLS. So this one directly comes with a 612 horsepower output for the 4-liter V8 bi-turbo engine. There it is. In this case also with a nice carbon fiber cover. And 4.2 seconds is the acceleration figure here. So that's 0.2 or 0.4 seconds difference than to the GLE, depending on if you compare to the 63 or the 63S. And all those new AMG engines here for the GLE and GLS, they both come with the MHEF system, so mild hybrid, and also with COD, so cylinder on demand. If that is really useful then for the fuel economy, we'll see about that when we're able to drive the cars. Let's move to the interior door closing sound. Yeah, it's quite okay, but actually we just been to BMW and the X5 sounded better actually, I have to say. So the interior of the door, this then is the leather red cover, also very beautiful and soft. Then this aluminum brush look right there, it's seat control also here. Big door pocket, illuminated AMG entry badges, and you can also get the steering with the microfiber on the sides, with Dynamica microfiber, that's their brand. That's actually pretty fancy, you should go for that one then, if you want a little bit more grip. Flat bottom, and the cruise control is right there on the left side, volume on the right side, and those ones will be controls for the suspension settings, and this one then here also for the driving mode at the steering wheel. Special AMG seats, they're quite voluminous as well. In this case with the 63 model, only available with animal skin, a normal GLE does offer a wide variety of choices, full article, leatherette, dynamic car on, on the inside, article leatherette on the outside, sportier version for example, or in Europe, even a lot of fabric options, but yeah, probably the throughout the sustainability together with the engine upgrade in this AMG version. So, let's take a seat right there, and yeah, on camera it's really hard to control it always with the Mercedes cars, if you control it here on the inside to get in the proper seating position. Yeah, a little bit like this. So, a lot of people actually sit too much land backwards, you know, like this, and then like, how can you actually, you know, control the steering wheel or maybe like even the, the brakes properly you know you have to be able to hammer the brakes also not sit too far away from the steering wheel also with the lower part so um yeah pay attention to that definitely but it's a very um very cozy seat position you're always in the gle one of the most comfortable suvs out there mm, the seat here as it is right now it's not built let's say for the tallest drivers however but you get along quite well and one means 86 or six foot one and that still leaves quite some headroom, even though we have the panoramic roof inbuilt here. There's also the option for a head-up display where you see this box. Unfortunately, those cars on the motor shows are not really properly powered, therefore we cannot see too much. There, with a dual screen setup here, which is standard then for the GLE, you'll be able to see more of that in our full driving reviews because we have a lot of those also for the GLE if you're more interested in what's going on right here interior overview everything is really central on this dual screen setup and we can also show you something of that here for example right there you can use the lower touchpad you can also use the touchscreen itself but you can also use your right thumb but not if the car is not properly powered so this would be possible and then the it would be you know zoomed in for example and scrolled right there oh for using tracks only we're not on the track but um, there are actually like even some you know, telemetry options here for the AMG model and so on, and AMG performance gauges when the engine is on. Again, if you want to see more of the touchscreen, then definitely tune into a full review. Then this one here is quite, um, um, you know, screaming out those brands here, splitting in love or hate. Still manual climate unit with nice clicking sounds. 
like that. Um, yeah, those buttons sometimes look a little bit weird when they're not properly aligned here. It's actually quite well done. The nice bright interior, so um, color-wise, it's also pretty cool. It brings some light in here, definitely. And the interesting thing is really, if you now compare this one here, the Mercedes with the X5, so GLE versus X5, before that BMW was lagging behind, but now when you look at some you know minor details here and there, actually the X5 has a better build quality on the interior. You know, realizing that especially when you're doing it one after each other. Cubby hole in the front here, heated and cooled cup holders, um, 12 volt power supply. I wonder where in this US spec is the USB charger in the front. I have a GLE diesel at the moment at home um, for a test ride. And there's a USB slot here, but missing in that one here. That's a little bit strange. So, in the middle console, a lot of black panel lacquer like being used here. Not such a fan of that. This touchpad here again, up close, go back to the home menu, volume, uh, GPS hotkey on the right side, left side for the driving modes. That will change how the car is driving. Told you that on the outside. Then just to rest your hand and stand air suspension, you can also raise it up or down manually. There's also an off-road mode available where you go up to have a little bit more ground clearance and you can also switch on or off this exhaust note. Then the split opening here for this armrest and you can see there are USB-C supplies then and the right one is for connecting the smartphone like it is at the moment and the left one just for charging. So getting in the rear of the GLE. Here we go and there's now in this new generation more legroom than before, plenty of legroom. And this is also a big difference if you compare for example the BMW X5 or then GLE Coupe to the X6. Well, GLE Coupe has a little bit shorter wheelbase, so the difference is not that huge then, but here especially. And But on the other hand, it's a little bit less comfortable to sit here and like in the, you know, than in the X5, because this bench here falls a little bit backwards. Um, hmm, yeah, I mean, you can put an electric control, by the way, here, this rear part a little bit more straight. This is possible, but the lower area, the seating bench, that one is fixed. I mean, you can slide forward or backward. That's also definitely a cool function. So increase the trunk here a little bit, or then again, increase the leg room. But then again, my point is that it folds backwards from front to the rear. And that's, you know, not so cozy to sit in. But still, it's very comfortable in here. So talking on a, comparing on a high level. Headroom, well, it's, it's getting quite close because we have this panoramic roof in here. If you want more headroom in the rear, Again, it won't be necessary for most tall adults, but if you want more, then you would leave out this panoramic roof. Other than that, what we have here, I mean, the electric controls are definitely quite fancy. This GLE also available as a seven-seater, by the way, if you like one. Not sure if it's available for the AMG. Hmm, they didn't say that. But will anyone go for that? Not quite sure. Then you would rather go for the GLS again. Here, some cup holders. Also use this one here as a ski hatch, one like that. And then in the middle part, you have another climate unit if you like one. There's also an option then to have the four zone AC in the lower part. Well, recently I've also, also seen some chargers in here, but in this case, obviously not with this spec. Ah, feeling like a saint here, right? You know, with the light from the upper top. <laughs> saint Thomas, there is one, right? Pretty famous one. So <laughs> let's open the trunk. And here we go. So pretty well usable, definitely. This lower part offers some more space. For example, also for a replacement tire if you like one. If you have the air suspension, you can also lower that one just a little bit. Here on the left side, you have just this light. Again, good dimensions. And on the right side, and if you want to flip the seats, you can use those buttons and it goes all the way electric. That's a pride, you know, quite fancy function, but I think a manual control is just easier. You can also get one. This is an option here. There we go. Maybe it's even helpful more in the seven-seater. See, it goes almost all flat. And then you can also go backwards with that to put them up again. It always looks cool on camera, doesn't it? Now let's get inside the GLS. Oh, the door handle here. I mean, some of their prototype cars here, but there's like a, a gap here at the door handle. Hmm. You know, at Autogruppe, we pay attention to every detail. Hmm. Yeah, but I mean, you have to say on the motor shows, some of like hand-built first cars. But we still show you that. 
So then interior of the door, it looks almost the same as in the GLE. In this case, we have here the carbon fiber inlets. You can also get in the Burmese sound system, huge door pocket. And interesting is that here is the one without the dynamic car, but the with a microfiber is actually better. Carbon fiber inlet here, also dual widescreen setup. Then those seats, they have some Alcantara inserts here at least, that's pretty neat. And also different styling, different colors are available of course for the seats. One more look at here when Holger shows you that seat, but the same seat form in, in, in the GLE. So the seating comfort, of course take a test seating here as well. And it's pretty much the same. So when you're sitting here in the front, you don't really feel such a difference. Maybe the hood is a little bit more, you know, higher than in the GLE, but it's not that you would directly say it's not, ah, there's a huge difference in the GLE and, and the GLS. Yeah, again, I think the hood is the one you maybe see that first. Again, here, plenty of headroom left, although there's the panoramic roof. But again, if you sit in the front, they share all of the parts. Just a quick comparing look because we have a dark setup here. That's again not special to GLS versus GLE, but just you can see how it looks like when it's you know in the in the, in the dark, also in the lower part. The bright one always gives light to the interior, but the carbon fiber is actually quite cool. However, the lower part here again is this shiny piano lacquer, which again is collecting a lot of fingerprints. And if we take a look here at the rear of the GLS, easy entry, and of course you have even more lacroom, and there's also a significant gain in legroom if you compare it to the predecessor GLS you will feel that so that's like even as I would be driving when you have all the way back this bench and you can also slide it forward electronically like this so there's a pretty comfortable uh, function but even if it's all the way in the front then it will still be ample so um, that's actually pretty cool and also nice comfortable seating position but um, it falls backward the same way as it goes with the GLE. There's also this option that you have this captain seating here. So this is the bench that goes all the way through. Captain seats are also available, but they have the same form. This is different, for example, with the BMW X7, where the captain seats option are more elaborate and upright, but then again, don't fold flat. The good thing here is, no matter if you go captain seats or seat bench, you can always fold this one here all the way flat, as we've just seen also. The middle part you can fold down here you can also put in you know, a controlling ipad here but that's an option inductive charging pad also for the rear interesting and some more cubby holes but you don't have to go for this option then and then when you it's very interesting go like this also electrically this one would be the best entry towards the rear and what we do here right now i would already set the driving part uh, the you know the, on the driver's side here, the bench to the forward, most forward position and see how that one then plays out in the rear. So now let's get in this third seating row. See here the seat is all the way then up and I've left the bench here all the way forward. I could still sit on this bench then with all the way forward, but I also left an angle where I could comfortably sit. And now I get some warnings from my tailor again <laughs> and let's get inside here that's yeah i mean it's quite okay and if i slide behind this bench here where i could still sit in the front it's getting very close so you know i have to spread my legs then a little bit uh, so yeah that's really very close i wouldn't say it fits well it fits directly headroom wise it's also okay but again it's mm, i mean you can sit here for shorter um for short term also with, you know, a little bit more adults. So like this, when you put up the head restraint. Um, but again, it's somewhat limited, definitely. Um, especially here with the leg room, if you come in you know, a little bit closer than here. You see, um, when I put my legs to the outer, it works. But when I put my legs straight, then I do hit this back here, although the bench is all the way forward. Yeah, that's how it is. Two USB supplies, by the way, here also for the um, rear. Also for the, you know, so we have two USB-C supplies on both sides. That's actually, you know, quite fancy, definitely. So, and they thought about Isofix here at the last seating row. So you can then install one, two, three, four child seats via Isofix here. That's, I think, quite handy. So if you drive a little bit, you know, smaller people or maybe with children, that's pretty flexible in here. Mm -hmm. So when we open the trunk right here with the Mercedes GLS, the same for AMG and non-AMG model. Of course, you have a longer trunk length. 
in general here at the moment six and seven seats are folded flat underneath some more storage this is a big difference here just longer trunk than in the GLE this is of course a little bit limiting because they want some armrests here for the six and seven seats and then you can control it also here with the third seating row you can put it up and you see there's actually still some decent trunk left even if the last row is up I also have the feeling that's a little bit longer than the BMW X7 for example which would be you know the new alternative to that and there's also this button saying all and when you press that one then everything should go as it is right now here all goes flat oh Alfa Romeo press conference with a very loud film in the background not sure if you hear that but that's also the reason why we use those big microphones on motor shows that we isolate the sound for you here this now all the way flat and then of course you know way way long area you can even sleep there if you put the mattress on that so that's the good thing in here about the GLS and because it looks so cool I will also use this button once again to put them all up again so let's see this all button and here we go magic yeah So here we go with our conclusion, while well, some other guys are also checking out the cars here on the motor show. This one here, the GLS, definitely the bigger one, if you need those seven-seater option or just a little bit more trunk space. In this new generation, it also you know, feels quite agile to drive, actually, and it will be even more in the AMG version. So the question is really, do you have any problems with parking space with the GLS? In Europe, it gets a little bit more complicated. It's easier than to drive with the GLE, of course, even more with the GLC. It's even better than in the narrow European streets. But definitely the new GLS generation and the GLE, they are quite similar, especially like the front cockpit and so on. And the driving is also not too different. I wonder if there will be more difference than when they are in those AMG versions or this if it's also pretty similar we'll find out more about that later on the GLE of course for you for you know for US purposes it's not a, such a huge car then for European um, purposes yeah it's already quite quite full size ish it is a little bit more agile drive yes it also looks maybe a little bit better because you, you know have a little bit more fluent line especially in the rear Again, from the interior, they don't have such a big difference here, especially in this new GLE generation, more legroom than before. Also, if you think about the other premium competitors, really leading in the legroom segment here. However, then again, this falling bench, you have to be aware of that too. So, I think, you know, price-wise, yes, the GLS will be even more expensive. So, I would rather go with the GLE because I don't really need the space of a GLS. But the question is then, you know, for your big family for example or for even more luggage then you're a little bit more flexible so both cars come quite close in a way also power wise told you earlier there's no s version here of the gls but there's an s version for the gle yeah if you go for the 63 or 63 s this is usually a little bit customer rip off um, to be honest because you pay so much more money even just for the s version just to get a little bit more horsepower a little bit more equipment here and there so i think you should really decide between the 63 models GLE or the GLS. What do you think, you know? What's the right one for you? Please leave me your feedback. And it was also very interesting to compare today when we think about the BMW X5 or X6M because we've seen that interior-wise BMW is leading at the moment their interior build quality-wise now. They also have a completely different style. The style of the Mercedes from the interior are a little bit more sensual definitely. The BMW style, a little bit more drawn back, and sportier also. The seating choice are way sportier. So it's also interesting, this market position where Mercedes more goes into this like classic comfort level. And also here with the air suspension, whereas BMW goes more in the sporty direction and goes for the M model standard with the normal adaptive non-air suspension. So pretty interesting what they do and also interesting for you to see and definitely compare also those other videos we have here for you today. Sad that they don't offer any animal skin alternatives here in the top sports models, whereas the choices they usually have at Mercedes are really awesome. Power-wise, this one will be more than you ever need, definitely. It will be more fun to drive, yeah, because of the acceleration. But there are also, you know, you know other interesting models, for example, those uh, three liter six cylinders are actually pretty decent. We've driven the 450, so a GLE 450 would be a nice one. 
There will be a petrol PHEV coming up as well. And we've already driven the diesel PHEV, which was also very interesting, definitely. With a big, big battery, they have put in one of the biggest for a PHEV car on the market at the moment. So, a lot more to hear and see about the GLE and both of the GLS. Tune into those videos, link in the video description and also in the pinned comment. And now please leave me your comment as well. Which one is the one for you today? GLS or GLE in general? And especially if you think about the AMG versions we've shown to you here today. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. So when I'm here over in the US, I always like to show you cars or experience the cars for myself, which are A, not super expensive and be also a little bit specific to the market, very successful here. One of those is the Nissan Sentra, which is here in the all new platform actually, the new 2020 model. So let's dig deeper in exterior, interior, and also different trims we have here on location. Let's go. So the Sentra is now a little bit wider and also a little bit flatter, so it looks sportier, especially here in the so-called SR trim. And then there's daytime running light together with new LED headlights. You know, that looks quite fresh and I said quite sporty, especially in here with the black accentuations with this new stronger V-form grille here and also with those honeycomb structures. Pretty spectacular in this golden orange color we call it that way maybe. Then also with a contrasting roof you can get there, also black mirror caps. And those are 18 inch wheels, so also quite big for this car and they make together this sporty look in this SR trim. What else is interesting technology wise, there's now an independent rear suspension that's supposed to increase the comfort while driving. We'll be really looking forward to drive that car one day also on the US roads. Classic sedan shape in the rear, but here then with an additional wing, SR lettering right there and a small honeycomb structure styling right here. Before we go to this actually quite nice exhaust here, it's not too big engine, but it looks quite powerful already from rear end with a modern signature here for the lights. Engine choice, actually quite easy with this car. We're not allowed to open the hood here today, but I can tell you more about the engine. So they go from a 1.8 liter up to a two liter engine now, petrol engine. So a little bit more displacement, you know, there's no replacement for displacement. And even in environmental sense, downsizing doesn't always make sense. Rather a little bit more displacement, but maybe less horsepower tune, for example. But in this case, also more horsepower, now at 150 horsepower, and you drive with an automatic transmission, which will be a CVT. And now to a different color and to a different trim, the SV, let's say less sporty, but more upmarket trim, of course, always how you define that. This one has also the so-called premium package. But what's also interesting, they also upgrade the assistance system. So this Nissan 360 safety shield comes from standard equipment now. That means the autonomous emergency brake for the front is standard. The blind spot monitor here, side mirrors, is also standard. Also the rear cross traffic alert, so you know the car automatically stops when you miss something when going reverse. Also standard rear view camera, I mean has to be standard at least in the US anyway because that's mandatory. But definitely good standard equipment also with a normal cruise control. Optionally then the adaptive cruise control and also optional the 360 degree around camera view. So those are two assistance systems options you can get. But the most stuff you already get from base equipment. I think that's a pretty fair choice. And one more rear three quarter perspective right there in the different color. Which one do you actually prefer from those two cars we have here on location today? Let's take a look at the interior. Door closing sound first. Yeah, I mean, we've heard more solid ones, so to say. But then they upgrade the materials here, soft at the inside of the door. This is then a leather red cover here as well, pretty soft also for the armrest. Where the window levers here, they are pretty cheap, so maybe you should exchange that at some point. Then you also have some contrast stitches here at the dashboard. This is also a little bit soft touch, so to say. 
This is the new Nissan steering wheel design from the modern car lineup. They also introduced it with some recent facelifts and so on. And then those seats, they're also a little bit sporty, also with then you know the, those orange contrast stitches. And I was told earlier by a product manager that those ones would be the leatherette seats here in the SR trim. And, and indeed, it's really amazing. This one here is such a high-grade leatherette, so it feels very very soft just from the surface no one could tell the difference if it's now like you know animal based or not so a high grade one really premium style i can just recommend it so um and again if you wouldn't know it i really had to check twice that they are really you know uh, <laughs> telling me the truth so this is also one of the examples that you can get a really cool sustainable and animal friendly high grade leatherettes and you can also get with you know with a basic fabric trim that's also possible for the animal free option so then electric seat control here manual for the steering column and i mean this is not a super expensive car therefore you you know you also see and feel some things which are let's say rather basic but they definitely stepped up the game here already and seating position is actually quite comfy it's a normal low sedan seating position i'm one means 86 or six foot one and together with the panoramic roof being here there's still some headroom left so no problem and you know you actually can feel quite decent in here quite cozy we we'll soon now take a look at the whole cockpit perspective interior overview quite stylish you have this v form here also in the interior then some soft touch and then round turbine vents style so this creates a little bit sporty atmosphere here the climate unit here with a nice clicking sound so that's also nice from the build quality and also you know some knurling around that that i really like that it's easy to control while driving like to have it straightforward also heated steering wheel is available so you get this new seven inch touch screen here you can see with a cable connection for the carplay and with auto is also possible if you are you know going with that soon a little bit more details to the screen and you can always black it out here or um, have this like day and night or auto mode that's also a nice function to have maybe a little bit brighter now helps you a little bit more then the automatic shifting in the lower part start stop action the button and USB-C and USB-A device next to each other so you can actually pick which one you prefer at the moment. Yeah, those cup holes are pretty big but they're not adaptive so they have to be really big that they don't fly around right here. And again, in perspective here at this compact steering wheel, you know, with a good handle, also with a flat bottom. So yeah, a lot of sporty elements we find here, especially then again in this SR trim. So see here, the CarPlay integration is quite well done. Goes all the way all over the screen and then you can actually not go from here back to the Nissan menu so I wonder about that so you have to use the hotkey right there and then you're back there but well I mean usually with this kind of setup you use the CarPlay or the Android Auto and that's it that should all be the thing you should go for oh now we're <laughs> the car's being turned there's also a camera button right there um front camera is not active at the moment you can see here there will be this surround view but the resolution of the cameras here they should actually be a little bit better but the main thing about this infotainment system will be that you use the carplay you still have a manual volume knob here and now to the rear seats here we go and when I'm driving as a tall driver, I exactly fit behind the seat. Just put a hand in front of my legs. And headroom-wise, although it looks quite sporty from the exterior, it works quite well. So I can also put a hand over my head. So it directly works for four tall adults. And it's also, you know, quite comfortable in here. So can't complain about that. Pretty, you no know, standard, you know, like for, you know, the size of a, of a sedan. In the middle part, it's actually also quite soft right there. This one here, by the way, has the premium package. Then, well, yeah, it would work for short ways, but I do hit um, the ceiling then, and it's also quite stiff here. So better sit on the outside. Isofix on the outside, of course. And then there's one USB-A charger here in the middle. And this middle part here, you can also flip down to have some cup holders then for the rear. So, what about the trunk area? Yeah, I mean, this sounds a little bit weird when you open the trunk. A little bit loose also and you see here it's actually quite wide but then there's a lowering sill and well, hard to see here but actually you have some decent space because not too much space is being wasted actually and you know 
how you can reach in there as well. And then underneath, there's also a spare tire. And we can also go around and flip the seat. Here we go, we have to go around for that. Here we go, and well, there's this one step here. Um, this might be a disadvantage, so, but you can see for loading things through. Well, now the other interior trim, the SV. What I found quite nice is that we have a bright color here that looks quite fancy, also with the seats. So interesting color choice. However, those ones are in the premium package here with the SV are the animal skin seats. So it's in the contrast then to the other, but you see in the SR you also have the other choice. But color-wise, I think it's also interesting to have this, you know, brighter contrast in here in the interior. And now to a conclusion for the day with the Nissan Sentra in this new platform generation. Very interesting because, I mean, it's a normal, let's say, everyday driving sedan and it's not too expensive. That's also what makes it so interesting because now with this new style, especially in the SR trim, makes it already look pretty attractive and pretty sporty. Also, again, with, you know, with the daytime running light like there in the front. Interesting also from the interior because we see a high-grade leatherette here. So you can combine, you know, if you want a slick luxury surface, but still being animal friendly. Also a good example for that. Then the infotainment system upgrades and so on. And still some decent space also on the interior thing. It's good package and also fair that they actually put all the base assistance systems just from standard equipment, that's I think also good for the customer. So nice price performance uh, ratio you can still expect with this vehicle. I mean, here and there, there could be some, you know, a little bit better interior build quality or when you open and close the rear doors, it sounds a little bit cheap and so on. But then you have to think about, okay, you know, always think about the price and then I think you can also live with one or two things, but definitely stepped up the game here with the new 2020 model. Looking forward to your feedback, and I really enjoyed doing this one here um, here today for your know, US spec car. You know, pretty popular here also in the US market, and looking forward to do more of those also. And really would love to drive those ones here also on the streets of LA. Welcome to this tour exterior and interior of the Audi e-tron Sportback, the electric SUV, even a little bit more spiced up. Here, join our auto Gefühl tour from LA. Let's go. Audi e-tron and the new e-tron Sportback, they are of course, same platform and also similar here in the very front with this front grille, which is from the form, pretty known from the other Audi models, but to have this electric styling, the front grille looks a little bit more shut off, so to say, and it's also a little bit more, you know, more matte gray, so not such a dark contrast. Still a quite sporty lower end right there, and this so-called plasma blue is exclusive color to the Intron Sportback. And interesting is that you also start with normal LED lights, then optional, you can get the LED matrix, and the newest thing is here, those ones here, LED with digi digital matrix light. So what's that? There are actually some micro mirrors inside the lights, which then can, you know, lead the LEDs even more exactly that, you know, don't blind any, anyone else, but also, that you can basically mark a lane where you are driving, that only your lane is actually illuminated very well. And you could think about even further use, for example, to mark something on the street for the driver and so on. So very interesting new technology piece. Four meters 90 or 193 inches. That's the same length than the normal Audi e-tron. The main difference, of course, is the rear silhouette where we have this falling roof line and this coupe style. So what do you think? Do you prefer this one here or the Audi e-tron with the more upright shape? Wheels start with 19 inch in the S line, the sporty S line comes with 20 inch and those ones are the optional 22 inch wheels, the biggest ones that are available and pretty massive definitely. And what we can see also is that those wheel arches, they come either in black like here, painted black, or in gray or in vehicle color, so those three options we have 
depending on what you prefer. Those are also the optional camera mirrors. You can also go with base ones and that they are better in aerodynamic reasons, for, for example. So reduce a little bit of wind resistance. That might also bring down the energy consumption just a little bit, at least on paper. Then you have those screens on the inside. But again, you can also go with the classic stuff if you also want to save some money on that. And here again, this special shape that the roofline is falling. So every SUV nowadays gets their SUV Coupé version. Also then here for the e-tron. The air suspension, by the way, is standard. It is set on a little bit sportier tone here for the Sportback. So I'm really looking forward how that one plays out with driving. And that also has something to do with how the car looks like at the moment. You know, if it's rather higher or lower, that also indeed changes the whole look of the car. And, you know, on those motor shows, they're not all the time rather put up. Sometimes they go a little bit down and so on. So this really has a big influence as well. The rear, of course, with this very flat window line then, additional spoiler, and then the light strip goes all the way over the vehicle. And again, real horizontal stress all over the place. 55 Quattro is, let's say, the power level. There's also the 50 Quattro available. Both Quattro because you have two electric motors, one front axle, one rear axle. Still, this car has a rear-wheel focus, actually. So this also makes it a little bit sportier. So most of the power is done by the rear motor then. And both, so the weaker and the stronger versions, both then with the all-wheel drive without any mechanical link. But that's actually a very interesting all-wheel drive system. We know it also from other electric vehicles and it works pretty flawlessly. We've shown that, for example, when we were driving the e-tron prototype in the desert of Namibia. That was pretty impressive. You should also check out that review at some stage. So, charging. Actually, you, you can get one on both sides, but here just on the one side is possible then with the additional DC charger. And the charging power is standard 11 kilowatt AC or optional 22 kilowatt AC. Or then with the DC, maximum is 150 kilowatt with the direct current then. It also has a heat pump, this car, by the way, to make it more efficient. And the battery capacity is either 71 kilowatt hours with the 50 Quattro or 95 kilowatt hours with the 55 Quattro. And more figures, the 50 Quattro, that one then has 310 horsepower and 6.8 seconds acceleration figure to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour and the range of 350 kilometers or 220 miles officially. And then there's the 55 Quattro, stronger, 360 horsepower in 6.6 .6 seconds, so 0.2 seconds faster. Or with a peak power for 8 seconds, is then 408 horsepower and 5.7 seconds in the acceleration figure because it has this boost function. And then on the stronger one, 450 kilometers of range or 280 miles. But that, you know, that again, official figures, it will be a little bit lower for real. So we have a frunk right here, which is actually eating up about 60 liters. This is just here for the motor show. Shouldn't be in there, you know, in your normal car. This just keeps power, but you can easily store your charging cables here to have a clean solution. And the real trunk. Well, you do lose some height right here. Compared to the real each one, this one then 555 liters with some more storage underneath. Here we go, that's actually quite decent, that's what you have underneath there. And then this top cover you could also remove, just you know, pull it and there we go. And you know, you can still use this trunk very well. We can also flip the seats to show you that. Because then you actually really also decent length to go through with the top tether behind here. And this one here would be a two-third, one-third split. Two interesting things we can already show you with this door. First of all, the normal door closing sound, which is very solid. And if you want to make it a little bit more gentle, then you also have, of course, a cost-worthy option, a soft close function. Ah, magic. <laughs> then inside of the doors, the top part is also from soft touch. Then a nice bright Alcantara insert here. That's cool. And also fitting to the exterior color, a blue interior color. This again then here, the, um, the, the, the image of the back mirror, if you have those cameras. 
and normal one would also be possible just to show that it's live here there it is yeah man <laughs> here we go hey guys <laughs> so and then the rest of the interior this e-tron steering wheel we already know from a normal e-tron the seats there are different forms available so there is a normal seat there is a sport seat with more bolsters, you know, stronger bolsters. Then there is an S sport seat with integrated head restraint. And this one is the multi contour seat, so the highest trim seat, so to say. And they still have an animal skin focus, like we see here, although it's supposed to be a sustainable electric vehicle, which makes no sense. At least in Europe, you can also get a base fabric seats. In fabric seat, that's actually um, good then. And when you go for the sport seats, also Alcantara in the middle available, for example, as choice. Then electric steering wheel control also comes towards you and in again. Electric seat control here as well. And it's a good and upright seating position, pretty comfortable. It doesn't feel too different if you think about also like an Audi Q8. Um, maybe a little bit lower same also for the normal e-tron and here also you have enough space one means a six or six foot one and still a lot of headroom left although there's the panoramic roof in belt here so in the front there's not you know not a big difference here soft touch also on top of the dashboard and it's not super futuristic but quite modern you know with this screen layout 12.3 inch digital instruments and 12.1 inch screen and top part and the lower than 8.6 inch i think it was for the lower part for the climate unit and so on interior overview and you know this wide area this is quite cool with the matte aluminum insert right there e-tron lettering and here we go with the screen all done we are touch so we got the big screen up there and the smaller one in the lower part and sometimes they also interact for example when you are in the you know in the gps mode and then want to type in an address then the lower screen also changes that you can type the letters for example or also write something you know like los angeles or, or whatever or whatever i typed in there now <laughs> yeah you get the picture um Soon also a little bit more details to that. And again, the steering wheel with the big holes here, right side for the volume, left side then to control the digital instrument there. For example, you also have a map view and can also change a lot. Soon also more details to that. In the lower end, it's interesting. You have a camera button, for example, for the camera system. And then this would be the driving selector, put it backwards to drive, forward to for reverse. And then a very open middle console here. This is a special design element, like a flying design element, but I'm still not a fan of that since I've seen it the first time with the e-tron and with adaptive cup holders as well. So first thing I do, deactivate this haptic input so I can now properly click like I do also with the smartphone, for example. Audi Drive Select is always interesting. The different driving modes will also raise or um, lower the air suspension, for example, than the GPS with a good view here on the convention center and the stable center as well downtown la guys so it's always impressive to look at it definitely everything is quite straightforward so easy to use this system is it maybe distracting when you use it while driving yeah you can say so because you don't have like an external knob or something but then again the menu structure is quite well done and CarPlay integration looks like that. Android Auto is also available. I'm doing that you know, with, with, with the cable. And it's actually from the music system. Um, actually quite cool from the surround sound as well. So for music lovers and different options they are available of course as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, Hollywood Bowl quite close from here. Like, you know, 20 minute ride or something. Pretty impressive venue, definitely. So, and then you can go back to the audio menu right here and I'm just back at the main menu. And what's now also available for all the Audi infotainment systems now, if you have the latest software upgraded and if your car is capable for that, here the wireless Apple CarPlay, so you don't need the cable then anymore. So in the lower area, I've shown that to you that it switches when you hit the GPS, but usually it looks like this here, then you control the climate right there, like with swiping or with, you know, clicking here on plus and minus 
or for example also use the voice input. Set temperature to 24 degrees. I am increasing the temperature there we are. So that's one way you can use a um, voice input and for example also you know for the GPS. Then those digital instruments right here for example with the GPS view so you can have that in your line of sight but you can also change it like that small GPS and then you know driving information focused. And here by the way you can also adjust those mirrors like this how you want to you know like up and down and so on so that's possible actually. I have not, and this is like the same way you would do like on, on the other side, remote for the co-driver side. Um, but yeah, I not haven't had the best experience with those here, um, driving at night and driving at, uh, you know, glaring sun. And also like, you know, position where it is, it's actually quite low down and then you're not looking forward while looking here. Hmm. So, and then this cover here, you can raise up, armrest and some cubby hole underneath. And to the rear compartment you now, the inside of the doors, by the way, in the back is pretty much hard pack. Um, not, yeah, pretty much. Not the hardest one, but pretty hard. Let's let's leave it that way. So let's get inside. And again, well, it's really nice to have this blue interior color. And legroom is the same also as in the normal e-tron. And, you know, that's definitely enough for tall adults. And headroom, well... It is actually just about two centimeters or a little bit less than in one inch, less than in the normal e-tron. It raises to the back part a little bit. So you're okay, even with me, one means 86 or six foot one, still have some headroom. So I think you can live with that. It's really more that you lose trunk height in a very back area. So here, yeah, I mean, it's actually quite comfortable, quite decent in here, especially on the outer seats. And then here you have some cup holders they are also adaptive for this part you can also use this one here as a ski hatch you can of course flip the seats totally isofix on the outside seats each there is an optional AC unit here four zone AC unit for the rear and also with rear seat heating and two more USB-A supplies underneath that hard to see at the moment and well there's not a big middle tunnel so you can also sit in the middle or crouch through a little bit better but the middle part is a little bit stiffer and then it gets close with the headroom so yeah rather for two adults at the outside parts each from the seat but the compromise you have to go for for having this you know more central design on the exterior if you prefer that to the normal each one still think quite okay if you look here at the rear compartment and now to our conclusion for the day with the Audi e-tron sport pack so the Audi EV with the high range, the first one, now as the SUV coupe shape. Do you like it? Please tell us in the comments. Of course, both cars, you know, are not too different. It's really more about this design. The compromise you have to take for that, yeah, a little bit more, less headroom, that's okay. Yeah, a little bit less height in the trunk, that's probably the biggest thing. I personally have to say, I really like the normal e-tron better from design. Not sure, but that's, I think, just a matter of preference. I really like this color exterior-interior mashup. That's interesting. Also looking forward for a first test of those new digital matrix headlamps, if they make any difference. Yeah, and of course, maybe like another range long-term test, how it really plays out, because in the first test with the e-tron, the supposed electric range was a little bit less than, you know, the official figure was, actually. Driving-wise, I can already tell you that from the normal e-tron was really fantastic you know the the car is not small but it feels very agile due to this electric all-wheel drive with the rear bias you have of course you know the great boost acceleration from the get-go due to the electric power so driving wise this car is really a lot fun and feels smaller than it actually is and with a little sportier setup they put here on the sport bag they even want to stress that of course we'll find out very soon when we're able to drive this car yeah, I you know the animal skin policy is not really up to date here with those Audi cars. There are newer ones coming up that will change that. Here they still have to, you know, do some work, especially if you want to sell this one here as a sustainable vehicle. Yeah, some homework right there. But overall, very interesting to have, you know, this one here now. You maybe remember we had this camouflage car at, um, at Geneva at the motor show. And people were asking, 
Can I get it also in this paint? Yeah, actually not. Those camouflage paints sometimes look pretty cool, but you cannot get them for real. I think you have to go to you know someone who wraps the car somewhat in this color then. Yeah. But you can also uh, go back to this video and check it out and leave your comment right there. So I hope you enjoyed this insight here today. We try to bring you even more electric, vehicles, re electric vehicle reviews step by step. Of course, follow also some other news here from the LA Motor Show. Music and sound, they somehow fascinate us. It has a very strong power. And just when you think about crushing off the waves, like you hear right there, you immediately think of some things like holiday, pleasant weather, the ocean, and so on. And what about sound with cars? You know, we know exhaust sound, we know engine sound, we know door closing sounds here at Autogefühl, of course, clicking buttons on the interior. And the automotive manufacturers, they really have own laboratories where they test that, where they maybe can compare also the competition. Everything just for the perfect sound in every single detail. Well, something works very well, sometimes not so good, but that's also what we test here on our channel. But what about the electric cars? So the future, the EVs, well, they're actually predominantly silent. On the exterior, there are now new regulations where they have to make a certain sound, also in a certain frequency, that actually, for example, also people who cannot see that well can actually hear the cars because it might be too dangerous otherwise. That's mandatory already. But what about also on the interior? On the one hand, you can say you appreciate the silence. On the other hand, you can say, yeah, maybe why don't we pick the sound? Like, you know, today I'm setting it in the V6 mode or in the V8 mode. Or then today in the silent mode or in the spaceship mode or whatever. And the interesting thing is BMW also thought about that and thought, you know, let's not make it all silent. Let's make it somehow distinctive. And we're here for the LA Motor Show and the those angels area of course and therefore we also picked this beach to have this you know sound and pleasant accentuation and we actually could meet Hans Zimmer he's one of the most famous musicians or film musicians in Hollywood he's been making the music for Lion King for Rain Man very famous for that also for the Batman trilogy with Christian Bale and recently for example the X-Men um, Dark Fiend so make so many very famous music and this also what makes this experience for those movies and BMW actually also has someone responsible for the electric sound design. And we also met him, actually. So in this video, we'll give you an insight about what BMW is planning for sound design for electric vehicles. And you know, yeah, we could talk about it in theory, but right now, let's listen to some of the sounds they have already designed together. So, for example, when you think about like a BMW 7 Series when it's all electric or even already for the PF, when it would just be stationary, how could that sound like? And then also, for example, when this car would accelerate, and that could also count for other PF or other EV models they have, what are you thinking for that sound? And then there's also a new startup sound because when you start a combustion engine, you know, have maybe like a roaring sound, or at least you hear, oh, it's starting. But with EVs, and I have to agree to that, something, oh, is it on now? I don't really know. And we've heard those startup sounds, for example, like, like with Kia, for example, this dun 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 dun, which you know sounds not that elaborate, but at least you know that something is happening. But they also put it to their combustion engine models. And BMW, Renzo Vitale, responsible BMW for the electric sounds, together with Hans Zimmer, they design now a new sound for the EV startup at BMW. And last but not least, what they also have already showed us is a special sound for the BMW Vision M Next. So for the next M sports car, which is so far a PF as being planned. How could that sound like when this one goes in the acceleration all the way through?
So looking forward to your comments, what do you think about those sounds? And now let's talk to the expert what they have actually in mind in doing about the sound design in the future. Very interesting approach and I mean it's a one very single aspect but it can actually mean a lot when driving a car. Hans Zimmer, yeah. thank you so much for having us here. And More than welcome. <laughs> of course, I want to know, when you think about a sound of a car, you know, what comes first to your mind? Is it like, you know, an exhaust sound? Is it something on the exterior? Is it on the interior? Is it the door closing? So what's your connection to a sound of a car? Well, my connection, look, without getting into a vast emotional story here, but one of the things which really interested me was that I think the combustion engine, whatever people say, it is a compromise. I mean, the reason it makes a sound is because it's not perfect, because the parts don't, they rub against each other, they, you know, you have explosions going on inside it. It's not as efficient as you think. And when you suddenly get to an electric engine, the sound of silence is really the sound of perfection. So I was thinking, hmm, let's start off with a blank canvas, with a white canvas of perfection, and see what we can do to humanize that. You know, not not every car needs to sound like a like either a spaceship or an, or a lawnmower. You know, somewhere in between there, there is there's something which could become become something human and really interesting. Why do you think that silence is maybe not the best way? Well, silence is not the best way because, first of all, on the outside, um, you're going to kill people that are walking in the way. And I think we need to go and do something to, to help that a little bit. And then secondly, si you know, silence is something very powerful. Because if you're in complete silence and, and, and a car, you know, the interior of a car is a, is a, is a, can be a perfect anechoic chamber. Um, and sometimes, you know, it, it can become a little scary to just be there entirely with with your own thoughts but but sometimes it'd be nice to sort of influence them i mean what i do constantly in film music is i see music or i see sound as a way of opening opening emotional doors for you to have an experience i'm not going to tell you what the experience is going to be or what experience you should have but at least present you with the possibility and i think dry uh, driving really has that you know, the, the the idea of going on a journey, you know, it might be an emotional one, it might be a, you know, or a physical one. Um, it's really interesting. And, 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 and to go and help you to have a, a pleasant, and exciting, uh, fulfilling journey, I think is um, a good start for, for this job. So how can you, by your experience to the film music, make a car feel more alive? I don't want to make the car feel more alive, I want your experience, your human experience, feel more alive. I mean, Renzo said this very smartly earlier that you know you shut your eye, eyes and the car is gone, right? But the sound of it still remains, you know. And um, sound is very much a 360 experience. And I think in this new world, and uh, you know, of 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 podcasts suddenly becoming really important, of our ears suddenly, ta you know, becoming as important as our eyes. I think that, that, that there's an opportunity to change the whole world. Looking forward to that, thank you. Well, this is the BMW Vision M Next and we already presented that one here to you in a separate video. If you're more interested in this one, we will also link it in the video description and the pinned comment. But the thing is, what it's about today, it's about the sound design and how will a plug-in hybrid vehicle or a pure electric vehicle at BMW sound like? Because there's obviously it's missing like V8 or V6 sound. It's of course on the one hand about what's sounding on the exterior, but also what you hear as a passenger or as a driver on the interior. And today it's more about what we hear on the interior. And you know there are also special sound designs for clicking sounds of buttons, how doors are opened and closed and how they sound. Manufacturers have own laboratories for that. And they now also have own sound designers for, let's say, all the beeping sounds on the interior. And now we're joined by Renzo Vitale. He's the BMW Group sound designer. So please tell us, give us some insight into your work. What means sound design at BMW? Sound design, it's about creating the voice of the vehicles. So giving every car an identity through sound. 
And what I'm responsible for is everything that is related to the electric cars. So I compose the sound for electric vehicles or also for hybrid vehicles when they are driving electrically. And at the same time, I also compose the Klangzeichen, the sound signs, which are all the, sign, the sound that you perceive as you are interacting with the car. Uh, so if you don't fasten your seatbelt or if you are turning left or right, the tick-tock sound and everything that happens there is something that I'm responsible for. Oh yes, those seatbelt warners, they are sometimes so annoying. Not necessarily at BMW actually, but you know, think of like a Ford or a PSA group. You know, like, like this uh, special sound when you don't have your seatbelts fastening, they get crazy. But I mean, in this case, it's also like meant to drive you crazy a little bit that you... Correct. I mean, that's a part of the challenge that we have in our work. You have to create something that might be boring or might be... Um, 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 something that might be annoying for you, but we also have to create a different uh, range of annoyance. Um, there are sounds that I have to bring you to react immediately, like to break without even thinking. And there are sounds that can be more gentle, but still like hitting you and saying there is something you're supposed to do. And this is the case of the seatbelt. So it's a warning. It's important for your life because seatbelt can save your life. And so we want you to wear it. Um, and we give you a few seconds to react. So the sound is a, a gentle warning that is still uh, present and takes you to do this gesture. And talking about the driving sound of plug-in hybrid vehicles or the full battery electric vehicles, you know, if you think about, you know, classic sports cars with combustion engines, you know, have like this vroom sound and it's like a, I mean, there are even some studies for that, that is like a natural reaction for a human body that, that is somehow pleasing. So how do you try to cope then with the electric vehicles where you could say, yeah, let's go silent all the way, but that's not your approach. So what is your approach? I have a different approach as uh, compared to the um, combustion engine cars. So the combustion engine cars uh, are very muscular kind of cars. The sound is loud in the streets. Um, it's very passionate, uh, it's very muscular, um, and it's something that gives a specific identity of the car. And it's, it's everything good with that. It's a wonderful word which um, exists in our streets, it's part of our story, but I think with electric car we have a new paradigm. There is a paradigm shift. The way the energy is created is different. We are moving to the electric energy and per se it's silence. And silence is a very, very precious condition that we always want to preserve also BMW. And so we begin with silence. And we, the idea is that how can we shape silence in order that it turns into a sound that it's um, not aggressive, but it's still emotional. Because BMW, as you know, is uh, lots about emotion and we want to still keep that in our electric sound. And we can do this. Um, so what I, I try to do is to create an, a new sound world, a new sonic world that we would not necessarily uh, relate to a car, but it's a new association that we are creating for the future. So to make it clear that also the energy flow, the way the car is moving is different as compared to control, um, a combustion engine car. But what should remain is the possibility of expression. Because I see sound as uh, a possibility for the driver to express himself. I always consider the driver to be a, a performer and the car to be like a music instrument that it can interact with. And being a musician myself, I know that whenever I'm performing on a stage, what I want to do is to exchange and communicate an emotion to the audience. And this is the case for the car. So I want the driver to be able to transfer this emotion to people driving with them, or also to people in the streets, but in a different way. I, I keep talking about the sense of elegance in the streets. So that's what I'm really, really concerned about and what we as BMW want to bring in the streets. Another way to understand car, another way to uh, perceive the uh, electric vehicles and another way to create the soundscape of the cities of the future. So what I would imagine is, um, you know, I would like to have some like playful options so that I maybe adjust like, oh, I want like a 
Star Trek spaceship sound, I want to have a Stargate spaceship sound, or maybe like a Star Wars spaceship sound. Or today I want like a V6 sound, I want a V8 sound. Even Elon Musk doesn't do that, so you know, he obviously doesn't you know, want that too in his vehicles. So could you imagine also like those very playful or joyful wor worlds? Or would you say, no, we as BMW, we decide that's right for our customers, that's the sound they should listen to, stick with it, or die. <laughs> so what I would say is that BMW stands for shared driving pleasure. So it's about communicating joy. And we try to compose sounds that are able to communicate the sense of joy for the driver. The way we understand joy, the way we interpret joy throughout our history. At the same time, as you just mentioned, the electric cars allow us to have a wider range. Um, and as you know, you can select in your car between a comfort, sport mode, and these are already two different rooms that you, are, you want to be in. And of course, we, we've done uh, multiple um, sounds. We, comp we compose crazy sounds that you can uh, experience. And um, I cannot reveal uh, much about this, but I can so, tell be, be honest, did you also try some like chipmunk sound or something in the student? Tell us. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't try the, the chipmunk. Come on, really? <laughs> <laughs> we, I mean, we did, we did really... Really funny stuff uh, because. Tell us. Does uh, uh, the sound or something? <laughs> no, I mean what what we've done. We have used um, some kind of uh, sound elements that you would not expect to be in part of the car, uh, but we never want it to be something that it collides with the sense of car. So of of course uh, competitors have uh, many different ideas from ours. But to, to us, what is important is that the concept as an overall element, it's consistent. And so that's why we try to be very peculiar about sound. Even if we create sound that are uh, joyful or playful, still they have to be something that match BMW, that match the design. Because, I mean, if you would do a chipmunk sounds with this car, it's something that would collide with each other and uh, I don't think it's something we, we, we would be doing. So just to be clear, you're doing it for BMW Group. That means how can a sound differentiate between Mini, BMW and Rolls-Royce? What's you know your main target there? Um, so for instance, I've uh, composed a new sound for the Mini brand, uh, which has been presented uh, this year with the new Mini Electric. And it's going to be in the street, I think, March, April next year. And Mini has a different story. Mini is a different kind of character. And so when I composed this sound, I had lots of exchange with the designer, the Mini designer, with the marketing people at Mini. And I, I want to make sure that when the Mini is around the streets and you, again, you close your eyes, you listen to something, in that moment you would say, this is a Mini or this is a BMW. This is the very first thing that is important to us, create this connection. And once we have created this, then we can expand this towards multiple uh, scenarios. It's just like BMW. If you look at this car, you have this design gesture. They are part of our identity. And we have the same for sound. So we created the new jeans also for the mini electric sound. And we're going to expand and explore then in the future. So do you think, I mean, everyone is thinking, okay, when we go to electric vehicles, sound will not play a role anymore and sound is less important. Do you think it's exactly the opposite? It's exactly the opposite. I mean, silence, if you, uh, if you want, it's another type of sound. So we are already beginning with this very um, iconic gesture of the electric cars, silence. But then it's all new kind of story because we know that people want to express themselves. So there are moments in which you want to enjoy the, sign, the silence and you need silence, but there are moments in which you are pushing on the gas pedal. You have this uh, crazy acceleration that you are feeling on your body and we want to give that also voice. That's what we do. So it's what we did also for this uh, Vision M Next car. We created a sound that when you are pushing on the boost button, then uh, it's like a new revelation happening. The sound is bringing you through different sound um, rooms 
we define four rooms for the Vision M Next. Um, and every room is coupled to the speed range that you are driving through. So the sound is developing differently if you are uh, driving 20 kilometers per hour or 180 kilometers per hour. It's a story. So sound becomes the narrative of your car. Sound is informing on everything that the visual is not informing you about. So tell us about your collaboration with Hans Zimmer. How inspiring is it for you? Which role are you playing? Which role is he playing in this collaboration? I mean, working with Hans, it's, um, it's hard to describe in words. It's a unique experience that I have had, um, that I still have because we, we keep collaborating together. But I have to say, it felt since the very first moment that we met as absolutely natural. Uh, we resonate on many levels. We have a same way of looking at things with different languages. So I'm a composer as well and I use different textures, different approach to sound. And so without, it has been at the beginning a process of understanding who we are. And in fact, I remember the very first time that we uh, met each other, I drove a car with him, he was sitting next to me, and I played uh, different sounds for him. And then at a sudden he said to me, he said, you know, I'm not going to judge your sound, I want to understand how you sound like. And it was the very first beginning of our cooperation. And then uh, when we composed the sound for this car, I went into the studio with a concept, which was very abstract, because I always start with these ideas taken from the art world most of the time. And um, this car was inspired by James Turrell and Olaf Eliasson, are the two artists that I used. And so I went into the studio, I start um, speaking about my ideas, and then he immediately started to turn these ideas into sound. And I mean, we've been working close uh, next to each other for a few days without leaving basically the, the studio at this moment. And it's like a process of, of um, collaboration. Sometimes he's the driver and I'm the passenger, and sometimes I am the driver and he's the passenger. So it's very mutual, uh, collaborative kind of work. Very interesting. Thank you so much for the insight. And we'll keep you updated, of course. Thank you. What will be developed from all those sound ideas and how your PF or BEF BMW of the future will maybe sound? And that's the guy who's developing it. So stay tuned. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, guys, here we are again, and I hope you enjoyed this sound insight for today. And also tune in to all those car review episodes from the LA Motor Show. It has been very interesting, definitely, this motor show. And I hope you really enjoyed all our coverage for today. And if you want to see more features about single elements of automotive development, more insight in the car industry, then please also leave us those comments. Then we know what we can actually do to deliver you even more fun and information here in Autogefühl. And also tune into a special BMW X3 review that is coming up, where we also drive a little bit around this area here to have some great insights there as well. Thank you so much for tuning in today. See you next time. This is the top spec of the BMW X6 in a sporty way, the BMW X6M, the true power under the hood. We'll take a look at that and of course also the exterior and the interior features. In the front, the X6M has those vertical black fins in the double kidney. In this X6 generation, the all-new one, it can also be illuminated. That's a very special feature. We've shown that to you in different driving reviews we've done with this car already. Then you can see the daytime running light right there. And LED is standard also for the main headlamp unit. This one, the optional laser light, which is not that effective here in the US because the effective range is reduced. 
but hey, you got blue accentuations anyway in, inside. Yeah. <laughs> so I think in the US you can save it as long as the regulations are not changed. Other than that, you get like, like more than 500 meters of high beam range, especially on the European market, for example. Then in the X6M, you got this three-dimensional lower bumper right there. So really strong, really massive. And the cooling system has also been updated to match the horsepower output. Here we go with the side profile, of course, the X6 with this falling roofline, if you compare it to the X5M, which is also available. Then you have aerodynamically optimized side mirrors right there, very beautiful. All black and black here today, but you can get different colors. Then here also the wheel arches in vehicle color. 21-inch wheels here for the X6M, pretty massive. Also in a dual-tone scheme, bigger brakes, for example, as well. Again, also to match the horsepower output. And Overall, of course, stronger spoiler design here also in the rear. But indeed, if you fit a normal X6 with bigger wheels, there's not too much of a difference here to the X6M model in the side profile. There's always more you can do with the front and with the rear. Technology-wise, there's also the anti-roll control inbuilt in this car, together with the adaptive suspension they do offer. And the adaptive suspension is actually quite cool. You in general, do not need an air suspension for the X6 or for the um, X, X5, even if you can optionally go for one from the air suspension in general for the normal models, because the adaptive suspension is really doing a good job. Here, of course, with a stiffer layout overall than here in this X6. And you also get an active rear differential lock to bring more power to the ground. In the rear, the new X6 generation features those horizontally drawn tail lumps, this is really changing the whole style of the car in the rear, especially. Then you've got this additional spoiler lip right there. You need it for a little bit more downforce. Because if you compare it to you know, an upright car in the rear, you have less of that. So you add some more by that once again. And here, XXM badge, you all see the competition lettering. And that means you, know, you have the competition model because both are available. So the normal X6M and the X6M competition. If you want a little bit more horsepower, and you want to spend a little bit more money even <laughs> to differentiate yourself on the market. In the lower part, you have this diffuser kind of style in the lower end and then real exhaust tip. In this case, here also with black frames around. So really massive, of course, they give a pretty interesting sound. We will soon be able to test that. Of course, we will keep you updated with the driving review. So this car, all about under the hood and in the X6, M 600 horsepower and the X6M competition 625 horsepower for this 4.4 liter V8 turbocharged petrol engine. Pretty powerful, of course, and 3.9 seconds, or in the competition, then 3.8 seconds is the acceleration figure to 1 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour. And we have already driven this V8 engine here with the M50i. So that already came close. This one even tops it up and of course everything will be set a little bit sport, a little bit stiffer and so on and so on. But if you want to get a taste of that already, check out our X6 review of this V8 engine and soon of course then also a review of the true M model. Let's now move to the interior. First of all door closing sound. That sounds pretty solid. That's nice. Then interior right there. Soft touch materials, everything, good build quality. Then this honeycomb style, Hofmeister King design element in the inside of the doors. Here you can also open the rear hatch from the inside. Then carbon fiber inserts here for the M models. The competition model also gets a separate entry badge. Yeah, and if you need some performance parts, you can even get special floor mats. That's also in the M50i review of the X6. Check out that. And then special with the steering wheel here, it's the M steering wheel also can be heated, but then you get those mode buttons and you can program them to your taste. So you have special settings you want to say like M1 is like suspension the stiffest and shifting characteristics like that and steering like that and you can set it to the different modes or if you want to have with M2 like electronic stability control all the way back then you can put that to this button for example so whatever you prefer. The sport seats here in pawn red <laughs> and for the M models they come in this even sportier style with more shoulder support and also with illuminated logo right there. This is also pretty fancy. However, at the moment for the X6 only animal skin seats available and in sporty cars especially we also want some, you know, like microfiber on the seats to be 
held tight a little better. Or maybe if you're interested in buying a great sports car, but still think a little bit more about animal friendliness, you might also prefer like a Sensatec Leatherette. They don't offer that for the X6 at all at the moment. Here the electric control, that's pretty cool that you can slide the front part a little bit more forward. And the seats are actually the same X6 and the X5 in general, but you feel a little bit more cramped in the X6 always if you compare it to the true SUV model because the A pillar is a little bit flatter. Still, it's a comfortable seating. You can also have lumbar support. I don't use lumbar support at all somehow. Um, doesn't you know, suit me that well, but for others it does suit better. And here, for example, it's also interesting that you can move just the upper part of the seat a little bit more forward or a little bit more backwards. So that gives you a lot of different adjustment settings. Steering wheel in an electric way. And you have a very good interface also to those screens. So really two times a widescreen format. Good grip for the steering wheel. Also with the shifting pedals, you can always shift down then yourself. And it will also feature the, you know, the latest voice input system. You can check it out in our full reviews then always. Because here on the motor shows, not everything is then properly powered or maybe connect to the internet. We can test all the features in the full driving reviews. We go even more in depth. But you can already see those digital instruments right there. And when you turn the car on, you see here there's a special M view where it doesn't go counterclockwise with the RPM, but just upward. So if a special M view, then also for the digital instruments. Now the interior overview, optional Bowser and Vulcan sound system we have inbuilt here, then the carbon fiber inlet, stressed to sporty style. Also, you can see something of the ambient lighting. Then the climate control is still manual here with colder and warmer like to be able to control that while driving very easily. Sadly, they use real animal skin also for the top dashboard. So there's no alternative to that in the X6M or the, in the X5M models. And a lot of carbon fiber use in the lower part. And I really prefer that because then you don't have so much black piano like we use. But there are also other styles available for the non-M cars, for example. Then you can open it and also have an inductive charging pad in the front also normal USB sub supply. You connect to the smartphone interface here with wireless CarPlay. And also some adaptive cup holes, they can be heated and cooled even. And we can test something of the voice input here when I just say, hey BMW, drive me to New York. Because we're in LA at the moment, we want to do a great road trip. Yeah, we can go to New York then. So you see, in this case, also good uh, web power here, so we can also do something with the voice input. Pretty helpful, especially for the GPS inputs. Close-up of the GPS map, really cool integration and so responsive. And the GPS routing is really awesome at the moment. My favorite with BMW here at the LA Convention Center. So, and the rest of the main menu, you see everything is controlled either via touch, so that's possible, or you can still use the central control knob in the lower part and then browse, for example, in that while driving. You also have a special M menu where you then configure your stuff with transmission settings or engine settings, and then you assign it to the M1 or to the M2 button. And that's actually pretty easily done. And there is actually no rear-wheel drive pure mode, as we know, for example, for an M8 or an M5. So here the, the X drive will always stay like that. You can um, adjust that one when the car is running, for example. Um, however, of course, with the SUV cars, it's also okay that they always stay all-wheel drive. But they still have a rear-wheel bias. That's clear in this case. And one more close-up here at the instruments. Again, in this case, for example, they will go counterclockwise with the RPMs on the right side. So it depends on which mode you are actually in and which view you then have. And here also the color of the car is displayed in the virtual instruments. Also, when some people on the outside open the trunk. So here we go with the lower area here. Special M shifting lever and then there you can set the transmission settings here at the shifting lever also. There's also a hotkey for that. Red start stop engine button. And you can get also to the M modes right there directly to change between road, sport and track. And exhaust node, you can also activate or deactivate it here. And then there's still this classic knob or turning, pressing knob, metal knurling around it with some hotkeys to reach everything quite well. Last but not least, this middle console. You can open it in a split way. And then you have a USB-C charger right there next to a cubby hole. 
Now let's get here into the rear and it has a bad package, meaning, considering about 5 meters extra length, you hardly have any legroom left, especially with those very voluminous sport seats. You can get along with four tall adults, no problem, that's the seat as I would be driving. But still, you know, they don't use the space they have that well. The bench, they've put a little bit lower and also falling backward here in the X6, if you compare it to the X5, therefore it's less comfortable but still on a good comfort level overall. Yeah, those special entertainment systems here, those, you know, um, I think you can also easily live without them. Not sure if it's really good for crash safety for the kids in the rear especially. Yeah, I don't like it that much. And they just mirror what's going on in the front. Not sure if that's really that useful. Headroom-wise, it still directly works also because they put the bench a little bit lower. Yes, it's also a panoramic roof built in this vehicle. And then you have in the middle part where you can fold some cup holders like this but you can also use this one here as a ski hatch just if you want to put the middle part down but you can also fold everything soon going to show you that from the trunk here in the middle part you have a climate unit still if you like it four zone AC is an option of course as most of the stuff with this car is even though it's the M model seat heating also option for the rear seats and in the middle part can you sit here properly yeah, well, it works, but it's not that comfortable. The middle part is actually quite stiff and also, yeah, ceiling-wise, it still works for me with 1.86 meter or 6 foot 1, but not really that cozy. So, um, yeah, that's about it with driving here in the rear. Still, you can use this car as a primary vehicle in everyday driving life. The adaptive suspension will also be, you know, enabling to do that. We'll drive that car very soon, but again, when you sit on the outside seats, you also get some decent comfort. If you want more, then you would pick the X5M. The height of the trunk is the true difference between X5M and X6M, or general X5, X6. So you're a little bit limited right here, but considering it's such a sporty and powerful vehicle, you can very well use this car in your everyday driving life. This is the way the top cover works right there. Also cool to have hydraulic struts for this co cover. You can get a replacement tire down there if you like. And you can indeed also have a 12 volt power supply. And what I really meant is that one here. You can flip the seats from here. And the cool thing is they really do fold flat all the way just right from here. Yeah, this is of course <laughs> right here on show. The reason why that didn't happen is someone put the front seat, the backrest so way in the back. There we go. So yeah, not ideal definitely with those screens up there but you can see now we have a very good loading area even for that super powerful car and now to our conclusion for today with the bmw x6m the most powerful version we have already driven the v8 and it was yeah i mean pretty aggressive already we could actually do a little drifting <laughs> even though when we haven't deactivated all the stuff because it had so much power and this car still really has a rear wheel bias even more so when you go to those M driving modes, which set the all-wheel drive a little bit more to the rear, uh, you know, even once more. Then in the front, really strong styling. It still works somehow that it doesn't look too much aftermarket-ish. Strong exhaust in the rear. For the interior, you've got those sportier seats and especially those controls that you have the manual M settings. Sadly, no alternative to animal skin so far. But in general, for all the X6 models, so the product managers really have to work on that. The package is, of course, not good, as we know from the X6. However, considering it's an SUV coupe style, you still got some decent headroom, especially in the rear. They work on that and with a new generation. So you got a little bit more space than before on the cause that their bench falls a little bit backwards. And with a little bit less trunk height, I think you can still live with. So, and if you're interested how it drives, again, check out the M50i review, then you can get somewhat a small, short first glimpse of that. This one here even stronger and really looking forward how the adaptive M suspension performs if it's still a good compromise between sportiness and comfort because people do want to drive this car as their primary vehicle in their everyday driving life. And let's see if that one works out very soon. I hope you enjoyed this view, review. Also tune in to the X5M if you're interested and again, the driving review we also link in video description and in the comments and please leave us your comments about this vehicle for today see you next time join us here for a tour of the bmw m2 cs from los angeles motor show exterior interior 
and of course also the engine spec here in Misano blue color. Let's go. So in the front, of course, some parts are the same as we know from the BMW M2 or especially the BMW M2 competition. Then above that comes the BMW M2 CS. And you can see here the black vertical fins in the double kidney, also black frame round. Then this carbon front spoiler, this is special then, definitely really massive. And also an additional element here on the hood. So it is indeed open, not just, not just a design element. And here we also have those adaptive LED lights. This one is still the current generation of the BMW 2 Series. There will be an all new generation coming up as well. So this one then here, the pinnacle of the sofa generation. You know, there's already a BMW 2 Series Grand Coupe, which is on a new platform, but this platform will not be shared here by this two door coupe. It's 4 meters 46 or 176 inches the length of the BMW M2. That's of course not different here with the M2 CS. Here you can see 19 inch wheels mounted in a special golden color. That's you know pretty much screaming out to this yeah, very strong blue color. We could also talk called Thomas Blue <laughs> because one of my favorite ones. However, you don't have to go for this one with the M2 CS. So you can also get you know a white bright wheel or a black wheel, whatever you prefer. Then there's an M2 badge here at the side, carbon fiber mirrors, and you can see here they are also aerodynamically optimized and stronger side spoiler right there in this typical coupe shape, black frames around the window. And here in this case, we also have then the carbon fiber roof. So this is one of the parts where they saved some weight. If it will play an effect overall, well, yeah, I think you have to find out on the racetrack. On the street, you'll probably not find out but maybe on the race track if you add up all those weight savings. So, do you like this very aggressive style? In the rear you also have this carbon fiber spoiler right there, another carbon fiber element above the exhaust and four exhaust pipes and those are really real. No fake exhaust here whatsoever, of course. M2 CS, of course, this one will be changed into the normal number plate, although this one also looks quite fancy, you know, you know like a showroom car on the street. That would be nice. So we also have a rear differential lock here that comes standard with the M2 CS as well. And they put the adaptive sport suspension that is featured from the BMW M4 in this car to give you so many or still a span between comfort and sportiness. So under the hood, we have a typical for the M2, the inline six cylinder, three liter of displacement, turbocharged, and in this case, 450 horsepower. That means 40 horsepower more than with the M2 competition. Pretty interesting. It won't change so much for the acceleration figure, but still, you know, more horsepower. And then you have this carbon fiber, you know, strengthening element. So to increase the stiffness of the chassis even more here in the front part. Well, but you pay about 33,000 euros or dollars more for this model if you compare it to the M2 competition. Yeah, if that's you know worth all the upgrades, that's on another sh sheet of paper, definitely. Just have to think about it. So this one here, then 95,000 euros, for example, being in Germany, so close to 100k. Yeah, that's really expensive for a two series, but it's also the top of the line model, definitely. Well, so what, what do you think about that, guys? By the way, the top speed is 280 kilometers an hour or 174 miles per hour. Yeah, about that. <laughs> Door closing sound. That's actually pretty solid for a two-door coupe, very nice. Then the interior here is, let's say, not exactly hard pack, but a little soft, but not very soft, so something in between. Then we have a lot of Alcantara insert, for example, here at the inside of the doors. Then a lot of carbon fiber is used here, for example, already at the door handle. M2 CS entry badge for that. Then my most favorite feature is this Alcantara steering wheel. So microfiber surface, really good for sporty driving and it's also entirely round. I prefer that to the asynchronous uh, steering wheels that BMW M sometimes does offer. And oh yeah, that's the most important thing, 
manual gearbox way to go. You do not have to go for it. You can also get a dual clutch transmission if you want that DCT. Just the same as for the rest of the M2 line. But here you can also stay with the manual gearbox. Pretty cool for purest car fans. And then those seats, those are special sports seats with more shoulder support. In this case here also with the animal skin spec, which is of course not sustainable and also not that sporty. They should have used also the Alcantara seats then in the middle to make the sporty touch really, you know, how it's meant to be. But let me take a seat right here. So Holger steps a little bit back. And the thing is, you know, with this old platform does not offer too much room. But still in the front, you know, you, you get along quite well. I'm 1 meters 86 or 6 with 1. Um, if I have the seat in the lowest position, there's still some head clearance left where then the steering wheel can be also adjusted up and down and also towards you and back in again. It also has a subtle 12 o'clock mark that I know what I'm doing and this has a really, really good grip due to this microfiber and again, the size and just, you know, that's it's actually pure round. That's really cool. So definitely tells you, you know, this is one of the very, very few pure driver's cars left on the market. And you do get along here, right? you know, very well, it's okay. It's nothing too fancy, definitely, because, I mean, the car is now from 2015 and, you know, the, the base even a little bit older. So um, it's not the newest infotainment system and so on and so on. But this one here is all about driving, you know, about the sound and just the driving experience. So you can also live with some of the, you know, somewhat dated features here. Optional Harman Kardon sound system, by the way, in this car delivers also a nice sound here, even though we're just in the compact segment. And we have the cockpit overview for you right there. This is interesting here, CS, microfiber cover. This is pretty cool, but I'm not sure why they're not using it more often, also in normal models. This one here is slightly soft pack. It's also not really soft, but also not super hard. Again, something in between. Well, I like that we still have manual climate knobs here, and also for the volume. There will be also infotainment system right here, but at the moment this car is you know, um, not properly powered. And I also promise not to start it. <laughs> yeah, uh, red uh, starts up engine button, by the way. And then the lower part here, this one to control the infotainment system, also while driving, the usual control knob right there. And this is again a cool feature. This microfiber, you know, also the shifting back here and also then right around this middle console. This is a special element together with even more carbon fiber being used. So this adds more of this true racing feeling. And you also have separate buttons, for example, to make the suspension, this adaptive suspension here, stiffer or then even more comfortable again when you're just driving on the road. But this one, definitely a car you can also take on track if you want to take the risk of taking a 100k car to the track and maybe damage it. Would you do that? Or would you rather take your old MX-5 with aftermarket parts for that than <laughs> to take the risk? Please tell me in the comments. Steering wheel, by the way, here, for right side for the volume control. And the left side is then for the cruise control settings right there. And instruments will be rather classic. You know, they look dark at the moment. They will just be illuminated from the back. And so they look digital, but they're actually not. So it's, it's like a mix of analog and digital, so to say. Seat belts, by the way, also with the M colors. That's pretty neat, right there. And yeah, it wouldn't be a complete auto full review if I wouldn't try to get in the back, although the car is not really meant to do that, you know, that way. Um, see here, you can slide them forward a little bit, like this, electrically. So that's actually a quite easy entry then. Of course, it's, you know, rather a dark hole. Ugh. And my tail, I won't like that. By the way, here, the seat, seen that one? Here those holes in the seat. This is again a lightweight sport seats <laughs> right there to get the weight down just a little bit. And I could actually still drive now in the front, so that would work. And I mean, it's not super comfortable back in here. It's still okay, but knee room wise, it, it does work also headroom wise. And a short look here at the trunk because you might also want to go to the groceries and you know, race your supermarket parking lot. and. There we are. So normal again for the two series. You can also unleash the rear seats right there if you want to load through some things. Of course, you're a little bit limited and also the loading still is quite high. Yeah, it's not the most practical car, but the raciest car they have. Now we're joined by Carsten Priest, head of product management BMW M. And of course, I could just tell you, ah, tell us how great your car is. But I could also challenge you a little bit and ask you, 
why would I pay 30k more for 40 horsepower more in comparison to the competition? Well, the M2 CS is obviously even more sporty, even more dynamic than the regular M2 competition. And it certainly has an increased exclusivity uh, as a special model of our CS family. So where do you see the different models from non-race trick use to pure race trick use when you go like from the normal M2 up to the real racing car? Well, M2 competition uh, owners and uh, fans, as we call them, certainly want the most sporty, uh, precise, agile driving that you can imagine in this uh, class. Uh, the M2 CS owner will certainly go a little bit beyond. He may even go onto the racetrack. And then on top of uh, the M2 CS, as you know, we have uh, just announced the M2 CS Racing, and this is purely designed for club sport activities. So what would be your, if you would pick one feature, what would be the, the most favorite one, like the, the golden wheels today? Or? It's a combination of uh, a lot of things, as you can imagine, starting with the engine power increase of 40 horsepower to 450 uh, in uh, the European type. Then obviously all the lightweight uh, details that we have, starting from the carbon fiber roof, the carbon fiber bonnet, the front splitter, the rear diffuser, insert, uh, the gurney. Um, also in the interior, the lightweight seats, the lightweight center console. So there's a lot of lightweight stuff in the car, uh, improving the power to weight ratio even further. But the most significant technology change would be suspension-wise, that they took over the technology from the M4, would that be like the most significant change? Adaptive M suspension certainly has an impact on uh, the overall behavior of the car, but the enhanced power and the improved power to weight ratio is responsible for the uh, acceleration of some two tenths of a second even faster than on the m2 competition so overall it's something you will certainly enjoy in combination with a very good uh, sound so there's been some fine tuning as well it's it's a really good package i should say so we have the uh, all new uh, grand coupe here as well two series grand coupe could you also mention something like that for the grand coupe uh, I think uh, two-door coupe is uh, probably the most sporty uh, body variant you can think of in this segment and this is why we're including all the independent or exclusive proportions of the car like the white track are very happy with this car and uh, the customers are very happy with it as well. Yeah, we also had you know, some um, viewers who were afraid with the all-new two-series with the coupe that it would also be front-wheel driven but that's not the case for the coupe then, right? No, this uh, coupe is uh, rear-wheel driven and uh, it still comes with a manual transmission. I think that's also important to mention because on the M3 CS and M4 CS we had MDCTs, uh, but uh, here you have the choice between manual transmission and the MDCT. And the rear-wheel drive will also be you know, just the same for the next generation 2 Series Coupe, Not, you know, unlike the, like, you know, the, the four-door model. A little bit too early to talk about the next generation when you have a highlight like this here on the show, but uh, we obviously like uh, rear-wheel drive cars in case that uh, the power is adequate to rear-wheel drive and uh, we can still get the power to the ground. You're talking about power, there's more and more electrification coming also for sports cars and electrification is nothing you know, bad for sports cars, still people want also like true sound, you know, especially in this segment. So what's your approach at BMW M, you know, how you want to go for the electrification? Are you like all in in the future or do you find some compromise or will you delay that? What do you do for the core brand, for the BMW M, so what's the approach? Like with all technologies, we carefully look at uh, what does it take, what do we need in order to fulfill the expectations of our customers and fulfill our own individual product targets. So electrification will be handled in the same way like all-wheel drive, for example, was or turbo technology was. Once it qualifies for an M high performance car, then we will definitely look at it uh, in a deeper way. But uh, for the time being, um, we still have to concede that there are some technical aspects uh, that need to be considered carefully like uh, the additional weight, uh, the recuperation that uh, electric uh, motors are capable of in these days. So I think there will be a little bit more time going down the road until we can say the technology qualifies for an M high performance car. So um, when you think about the M product portfolio, which car, you know, if you have to pick one, you know, for driving yourself just like every day, which one would you go for? Well, today I would definitely go for the M2 CS. Of course. Being, being a big fan of the M2 competition already, because uh, this is obviously the core of our brand to have comparatively compact cars that are light and that have a lot of uh, power. I mean, that's uh, the perfect formula when you want to be as close to motorsports as possible. 
So the first guy you see driving this one here on the road, probably this guy, right? Thank you so much for the insight. Thank you. And now to the conclusion for the day with the BMW M2 CS. Yeah, of course, it doesn't make sense to go for this upgrade price-wise if you consider, you know, the horsepower upgrade you get. You'll be just fine with a normal BMW M2 and, of course, also with the BMW M2 competition. So, yeah, this is just, you know, top of the line if you don't care about the money, if you want the sportiest M2 there is without going to the real racetrack car. So this one here, of course, you can still get the license plate for. That's probably the most important thing then here. Do you like that approach? And would you actually go for the extra money? Yeah, I mean, just a few guys will be able to, to you know, to afford that here for a 2 Series BMW. What's actually true, and then, you know, I agree to um, the, the problem manager there that this one here, the compact car, is really rather the core of the BMW M brand because the big cars, they're just too heavy to be, you know, in this very sporty heritage from BMW. And, you know, the legendary cars were not necessarily the most, you know, you know, the, the biggest ones and so on and the one with most horsepower, but rather the ones that were really sporty before the, because they were the most compact ones. So pretty interesting. Design-wise, I mean, it still works somewhere also on the street. Of course, it looks a little bit aftermarket-ish if you compare it to the normal M2, yes. So the normal M2 would be a little bit more subtle, more elegant, but that's an up to you what you prefer. This one here, as I said, still on the old platform, and as far as my information goes, even if they didn't want to uh, admit that here yet, that the all-new generation will still have all uh, the rear-wheel drive, because they will still feature it on the 3 Series platform then, on the new 3 Series platform, whereas the Grand Coupe of a 2 Series is featured on the 1 Series platform and also with the front wheel drive. So this will still be the differentiation. So what do you think? Give us your feedback and also tune in to other 2 Series reviews of us. We also have the new 2 Series Grand Coupe as 235i. Not driven yet, but maybe if you watch this video at the later stage, then we will have driven it. So also follow us to keep to stay updated here with new videos also for the BMW M cars here at Autogefühl. This is the Volkswagen Atlas Cross Sport here on Autogefühl from the LA Auto Show and you might ask yourself meanwhile like every SUV has the right to have an SUV coupe version. Well the Atlas now comes with one as well a little bit cut off. What else is different? We'll talk all about design, exterior and of course also the interior features in our special exterior interior static review from the motor show. Let's go! The Volkswagen Atlas is meant for the US market and it's also built in the US in Tennessee. And Atlas and the new Atlas Cross Sport, they look pretty similar as for the front grille, pretty strong stance, rectangular design. But again, the daytime running light is a little bit different from the signature right here. And this one also comes with this new VW IQ light, this is their new brand name for their more elaborate LED headlamps. So the Atlas Cross Sport is a little bit flatter and also a little bit shorter. So 4 meters 97 instead of 5 meters 04 or 196 inches instead of 198 inches. But that's more about the overhang. It has nothing to do with the wheelbase. The wheelbase from the Atlas Cross Sport and the Atlas is absolutely the same. At the moment there are 20 inch wheels mounted. In the R-Line it goes even up to 21 inch. That's of course pretty huge for such a vehicle then. And here you got a cross sport batch. And of course the main difference next to the you know standard rather rectangular wheel arches here also. The main difference then is here that we got a rather falling roof line and where the normal Atlas, you know, is a little bit more upright and here also from the window graphic, this looks a little bit sleeker, a little bit more elegant. And I actually think, you know, that's, that's quite well done. It looks indeed a little bit sportier. And I mean, it still offers a lot of space on the interior. We'll soon experience that one together. But overall, I think it works very well. And to me, the most important thing about the Atlas is 
it's not a super expensive car, so we know a lot of big premium SUVs and so on. But this one is actually one that has a decent size already, but it's not super high in the price. That's what's making this vehicle to me actually that interesting. Well, what's your take? In the rear, the Atlas Cross Sport has a flatter rear window and also those tail lamps that look a little bit more modern because they have a new LED signature right in there. Again, also with this new IQ light brand design. This one is, by the way, the SEL trim. We also have a little, little you know, other trims and colors here on location showing very soon. This one also the one with V6. We soon get into the details about the engines. And you can see here, there's also a towing hook available. So if you want to do that, and that one especially then would speak for the V6. Of course, there are also smaller engines available. And the only thing is, yeah, you know, this fake exhaust style here. Hmm, that's not my type of thing. Is it yours? So what about engines? You either get a two-liter four-cylinder turbo petrol engine with 238 horsepower, or this one here, the 3.6-liter V6 with 280 horsepower, the stronger one. That one then suitable for 2.3 tons of towing capacity. So that would be your choice if you want to have a trailer or just a little bit more power under the hood. And now some more colors for you. There's also the SEL trim, but here in the gray, it's not entirely matte, but also not super shiny. We also know this color, for example, from a Golf GTI, Golf R, as well also from, from Audi and so on. Uh, this color has been used all over the Volkswagen AG, and I think it does also fit to the Atlas Cross Sport, does it? Or what about white, which again proves my point that especially Bigger cars look always even bigger in white than they do with dark colors. And there's also a lighter blue available, for example. This one is the SE trim, so not SEL. But I mean, it's really hard to pick on the differences. The color makes all the difference, you know, at first sight, definitely. But here we also see later on at our interior part that there's also a little bit, you know, different seats, for example. We'll also take a look at those. Well, the door closing sound is nicer when the windows are up. However, a lot of cars here on the motor shows have the windows down. Maybe people don't lock themselves on the inside or something. I don't know. But still, considering the windows down, quite solid still from the door closing sound. Then there's soft touch here at the top part. Not really very soft, but also not hard. In let's see a little bit blue tone, then some leather red cover right there. Also the inside of the doors, standard Volkswagen buttons that you get along, you know, pretty pretty well and also easy when you know the Volkswagen cars. Then there's a new steering wheel that is exclusively now for the Atlas Cross Sport with the new VW logo as well, this retro style logo, and the steering wheel looks more modern than before. You can also get digital instruments as you can see right there with the screen just behind the steering wheel. Those all digital instruments where you can, then for example, follow some GPS commands as well. This one in the SEL trim, as I said earlier, the seats actually quite wide. In this case, the animal skin variant, but there are also other non-animal skin options depending on, on, on the trim, of course. And let me get inside. The moment the seat was put way, the, way, way in the front, I'm not sure who, hmm, who was sitting here. And the thing is, you realize the seat is really very wide it offers you a lot of space even if you are not very small or something so that's pretty cool and you sit upright it's seating wise almost a um, feeling like in the Volkswagen Touareg it's just a difference that it's like more than double the price <laughs> so this one is then quite attractive still price wise manual control here as for the steering wheel and I think this new style here um, they've been introducing that with their smallest SUV with the T-Cross the first time, like in his angular design right there, and that actually looks quite cool. There is a panoramic roof available with 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1. There's still some headroom left right there, and you have so much space in the front. That's really nice. Um, it's also like a leatherette design for the top dashboard, which is also soft touch, so could very well imagine going a long, long journey here. Yes, it doesn't have like a super premium approach. For example, here there are a lot of hard pack materials in the lower part and so on. But then again, consider the price. And I think then it's actually quite okay. Interior overview here with a rather straight design and everything is pretty simple and easy to use. This is a very, very straightforward car. And you can see here the climate unit is still somewhat manual. So easy to control it while driving. 
automatic gearbox right there, adaptive cup holders. Here I already put in the Apple CarPlay connection, Android Auto is also possible, soon more deals to that screen. So pretty modern infotainment system, not the most fancy one, but I like to have still the buttons here for the audio and also here for zooming in, in and out the map. It's also, um, you know, has also an advantage. And again, the virtual instruments here on the left side and a pretty compact steering wheel. I like, again, the new design. Cubby hole right here, but this may be a little bit too open. I don't know. It's also a massive glove box right there. So, again, most, you know, definitely simpler than most of the other interiors we've seen on the motor show. But I think that's also somewhat customer oriented when you don't make it too complicated. Or what's your take on that? And now, close up right here, the CarPlay integration uses all of the screen. And then we go back to the VW menu, and there's, for example, a GPS hotkey here for Los Angeles. There we go. Depends on your connection and also how responsive it is or not. But also, again, pretty straightforward, easy to see. One thing is, I mean, the left side is not on yet, but it seems to me that here also we can either see it on the left side or then again on the other side um, that we know can switch it around because that at the moment here the map is not being displayed. So that's one of the weak points with the infotainment system that are not that good in the processing power. You can still connect your phone via Bluetooth, that would also be possible. And there's also the car me menu where you have like a consumption overview, for example, um, or here's some vehicle status, whatever you, you want to need. Lower middle console, pretty wide again, two USB-A slots in the front, that's also where I connect the smartphone. Then here those adaptive cup holders again up close, driving modes that adapt also for, you know, for off-road driving, for the overdrive distribution for example. This one here, a front wheel driven platform, so it will always be front plus rear on demand when you have overdrive. And then this armor steel leather red and what a huge middle console. It's more like an like American pickup style as for the width and another USB supply in there. And even more interesting about this vehicle is of course the rear area and this is the seat as I would be driving and there is ample of legroom left here. This is really amazing and it's, it's by no means the longest car but this one here is a quite good package. It's using all the space it has. It's also a advantage that you don't have such a long front hood because of the front wheel driven platform. So that's really good and also how wide it is here even and very very comfortable upright back seats you can also you know when you want to flip those you can adjust it it goes a little bit forward and also the angle goes a little bit steeper you can also lean backward then you have a rather you know sleeping position but that's also the same mechanism then you fold the seats flat all together here middle armors with some cup holders non-adaptive actually and in the middle part you have, you have optional seat heating you have two more USB supplies in the lower area, for example, 115 volt supply in this case done here. And when I go to the middle position here, there's not a high middle tunnel and it's actually quite cozy. One of the very rare cars where it's actually quite good to sit in the middle seat here with the panoramic roof inside. Headroom is, well, move to the back part in the side again. Headroom also still okay, 1 meter 86 or 6 with 1, just remember. And then when I use this lever here, Ultimately, I can put the seat all the way front. You see here the lower part goes down, the upper part goes above that, that we have a good, you know, actually good leveling to the, to the rear. And we'll soon take a look how it looks like from the trunk. So what about the trunk right here? Wow, those are really square dimensions and I've already flipped one of the seat half. You cannot do it from here. You have to do it from the, from the rear, but you can see here one is up, the other two thirds is down and there's really massive amounts of space, pretty cool. Here's a replacement tire and also the sound system on the inside. And the only thing, you know, where you're a little bit limited if you compare it to the original Atlas is here, the height right to the rear part. But for most of the stuff you load in, you can definitely live with that. And what's interesting, what about the child safety test? Whoa, this has some serious torque from the electric motors. Definitely too much. I think this is not safe. So now another interior here, the SE trim. And I think this is quite cool here in this uh, wood look. You know, also feels quite nice. And then the bright interior to that, that's pretty cool. Especially the blue exterior color. And then also different seats. 
Actually, this one is the leatherette, so the animal-friendly version. And how do you see that? The real animal seeds, they have like more segments here design-wise, and this one, the leatherette seed, has less segments. That's, you know, how you can see it from the outside, and it's available in black and also in beige, like here, and it brings also more brightness to the interior. And this, of course, also then the better price performance choice. Interesting to see that. So it's pretty cool that they also put a lower spec car on location here, actually. So not all manufacturers are actually doing that. So, and the seating comfort is actually, you know, pretty much comparable, so that doesn't make too much of a difference. And what else is interesting? Here, for example, we also have the analog instruments, not the four digital ones. But I mean, you can also just easily live with that. It's not properly lit up here at the moment, but we can also give you one more close-up of that. And we also have this fake wood inlet right there, but again, it looks actually quite decent. So why not going for that one? And now to our conclusion for the day with the Volkswagen Atlas Cross Sport. Well, it's not too different from the Volkswagen Atlas, but the exterior design definitely freshens it up a little bit. The Atlas looks, let's say, a little bit bulky in comparison to this one, so more elegant, sportier, and I think it works very, very well. So it's not a small car, it offers really decent space on the interior, but with the cross sport version, it, you know, looks somehow better, I think. Quite often, I don't like those SUV coupes, but here it's not like like a round egg shape. I think it really found a good design language right there. And I mean, the space you have on the interior in general is absolutely great here. It's a very good package, especially how much room you have on the rear seats. That's amazing. Then, you know, some updates there in the front if you compare it to the original Atlas, like with the new steering wheel. And it's very, very straightforward how you can control everything, you know, like with the old school climate units. But it doesn't have to be super, super fancy everywhere and everything, you know, hidden into an infotainment screen. So very straightforward car, and that's also what I prefer, you know, with this car. Then, again, the price performance. Hardly any other car at this size has such a good price performance, actually. That's probably the most interesting thing about this one. The only compromise, I mean, headroom in the rear is totally fine, like with normal Atlas. The only compromise that you lose a little bit of height and trunk in the back area. I think you can also easily live with that. So, what's your take on that one? Please leave me your comments to the Volkswagen Atlas Cross Sport. And also tune in to our Atlas driving review. And I hope we'll be able to drive this one here also in the US very soon. See you there. And of course, at other motor show parts here from today.